Chapter 1, The Weeping Woman The Argument at Work He had always prided himself on control, over his work, his family, his thoughts. Life's routine, though sometimes exhausting, was predictable. Until today, the argument at work was like none before. It wasn't just a disagreement, but a rupture. He could feel it in the eyes of his colleagues, hear it in their sharp tones, as though something had broken loose beneath the surface. A faint crackle of disdain seemed to linger in the air. There was a coldness in the room, an unspoken shift, the kind of exchange that, once unleashed, altered the course of everything. As the meeting ended in a tense, unbearable silence, he felt as if the ground beneath him had moved. The certainty he had relied on for so long had begun to unravel. The Drive Home The drive home blurred into a haze, his thoughts spinning between what had been said and what couldn't. Be taken back. The city lights flickered in the distance, melting into the twilight like reflections on shattered glass. Everything was slowly fading, and the world around him felt unfamiliar. There was something disconcerting about it, as though he were seeing everything through a cracked lens. A ticking sound from the dashboard seemed louder than usual, skipping every few beats, or maybe it was just his heart echoing back at him. The rhythm of it created an unsettling feeling, a pulse that matched the anxiety swirling within him. Nighttime and sleeplessness. When he finally reached home, the house stood before him like a distant memory, familiar, but somehow changed. Inside, his children's voices echoed, muffled, as though spoken from another room. His wife's eyes met his, but there were no words. She knew something had shifted. They both did, though neither could name it. He sat at the edge of the bed that night, his thoughts circling like crows over an unseen wreck. Sleep teased him, but it wouldn't come. The ticking from earlier seemed to follow him into the quiet of the room, each tick echoing in his mind. He turned the events over in his mind, replaying the argument, trying to understand the new cracks forming in his carefully built life, a life that now seemed as fragile as glass. But some fractures run too deep, too far beneath the surface to see clearly. When exhaustion finally claimed him, it wasn't a relief. His mind slipped into heavy dreams, fragmented, elusive, and far from peaceful. He found himself walking along a desolate path, the air thick with something he couldn't name, as though the weight of the day had followed him into sleep. The sky above hung low, gray and oppressive, and the shadows around him moved with an intent he couldn't place. His steps felt heavy, uncertain, as if something waited ahead, something from which there would be no turning back. The Encounter with the Weeping Woman Ahead, on a small rise, a woman sat on a large stone, her face hidden in her hands. She was weeping, her shoulders shaking with the weight of it. He hesitated, drawn to her sorrow but unsure of what he should do. Slowly, he approached, each step toward her feeling heavier than the last. As he neared, he saw that she was dressed in simple, weathered clothes, her form slight and fragile. She did not notice him at first, lost in her grief. He stood before her, unsure whether to speak, when she finally raised her head. Her face was pale, streaked with tears, her eyes a deep well of sorrow. She looked at him with a gaze that pierced through his own pain, and he felt it, an overwhelming sense that this grief was not hers alone, but belonged to the world. The horizon behind her seemed to pulse, moving closer or further away as though it had a will of its own, adding to the sense that reality itself was shifting. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came. There was something about her presence that made silence feel more appropriate, as though his own voice would shatter something fragile between them. The woman wiped her eyes slowly, her fingers trembling, and when she spoke, her voice was soft, almost fragile, yet filled with an unmistakable weight, like the distant murmur of waves, ebbing and flowing, each word drawing him deeper into her grief. You've seen it too, haven't you? She asked, though her gaze remained fixed on the horizon, distant and unfocused. Seen what? He managed to ask, though his voice felt smaller than he had intended. She glanced at him briefly, then returned her eyes to the barren land. The decay. 
the slow unraveling of everything. He felt an uncomfortable stirring in his chest, as though his very soul was reacting to her words. So, it's too late then, he asked, almost afraid of her answer. If everything is already decaying, what hope is there? The woman tilted her head slightly, her eyes softening once more. It is never too late to change course, but you must see the decay for what it is before you can turn from it. He blinked, confused. See it? How? The woman rose from the stone, standing before him. She was smaller than he had imagined, yet her presence seemed to fill the space around them. She gestured to the barren landscape that surrounded them. Look around you. This place, this desolation, it mirrors what happens within. The more you ignore the signs, the more you indulge in the ease of the wide path, the more this becomes your reality. He looked at the cracked earth beneath his feet, at the withered trees that dotted the horizon. The horizon seemed to pulse, shifting as if it had intent. There was nothing alive here, no sign of hope or renewal, only dust, only silence. But this is just a dream, he said, his voice uncertain. Isn't it? She smiled faintly, a sad smile, and for the first time, she stepped closer to him. Dreams are often more real than the waking world. They reveal to you what you are not willing to see when your eyes are open. He shivered at her words. There was something deeply unsettling about the way she spoke, as though she knew far more than she let on. Do you want to see? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. He hesitated. There was a part of him that wanted to turn away, to retreat back into the comfort of his ignorance. But another part of him, perhaps the part that had brought him here, wanted to know, needed to know. Yes, he said, though his voice wavered. The woman reached out and touched his arm gently. Then follow me. The crying woman led him forward, past the stone where she had been sitting. As they walked, the landscape around them began to shift. The barren earth gave way to a vast, open road wide and straight, stretching far into the distance. Chapter 2. The Wide Road There it is, she said, nodding toward the road. The path most take. It looks easy, doesn't it? Smooth, clear, no obstacles in sight. He nodded, staring at the road. It was so different from the desolation behind them, so inviting. For a moment, he was tempted to step onto it. But look closer, the crying woman said her voice firm. He squinted, trying to see what she meant. And then he saw it. Along the edges of the road, just beneath the surface, there were cracks, small at first, but growing deeper and wider the further they went. And in those cracks, he saw something dark, something festering, like maggots. What is that? he asked, recoiling slightly. She sighed. That is the decay. It starts small, so small that no one notices. But the further you go, the more it consumes. And by the time most realize, it's too late. He stared at the road, now seeing it for what it was, a facade, hiding the rot beneath. The ease of the path was an illusion, and the further one traveled on it, the more trapped they became. He turned to her, the cold weight of realization settling in his chest. Is there no way to stop it? He asked, his voice barely a whisper. The crying woman did not answer right away. She stood beside him, her gaze still fixed on the road ahead. There is always a choice, she said at last, her voice low and filled with meaning. But not here, not on this path. The air around them felt heavier as they stood at the edge of the decaying path. The reality of what lay ahead weighed down on him. What if someone wants to change? He asked, his voice trembling slightly. What if they want to turn away from the destruction? The crying woman turned to him, her expression softening. Then they must learn to see the other path, the one they have yet to discover. But it is not easy. The narrow path is often hidden, obscured by the chaos of the wider road. He searched her eyes, desperate for more clarity. Where is it? How do I find it? It requires intention, she replied, stepping back to face the vastness of the landscape once again. It is a path forged in struggle and sacrifice. Most are too afraid to seek it, but it exists, always. He stood in silence, absorbing her words. The weight of her revelation settled heavily in his mind. 
He felt a strange mix of fear and curiosity about what lay ahead. Is there nothing we can do for those who walk the wide path? He asked, his heart aching for the countless souls lost to the rod of their own making. Only to show them the truth, she said, her voice filled with a quiet resolve. Pray for them, and to hope they find the courage to choose differently. That is where your journey begins, first with the understanding of decay, and then with the search for the narrow path. As her words echoed in his mind, he felt the landscape around him begin to shimmer and fade. The weight of the conversation lingered, an echo of urgency, as the dream started to dissolve. But then he found himself walking, walking where she warned him not to go. The road stretched before them, wide and inviting. As he walked, he noticed how the air seemed lighter here, the oppressive weight of the barren landscape fading behind them. The path was lined with trees, their leaves rich and green, the sound of water rushing somewhere in the distance. It felt peaceful, almost joyful. For the first time since the dream had begun, he felt a sense of relief. Maybe this wasn't so bad after all. The crying woman trailed behind him, her steps hesitant. He could feel her eyes on his back, a silent warning. You shouldn't go further, she said softly her voice barely carrying over the sounds of the lushness around them. He paused, turning to her. But look at it. It's beautiful. How could this be wrong? She didn't respond at first, her gaze fixed on the path ahead. Beauty can be deceiving, she whispered. Especially here. Despite her warning, he found himself drawn further down the path. The trees grew taller, their branches forming a canopy above filtering soft light that flickered gently across the ground. The greenery around him was vibrant, the sounds of life all around him, birds singing, the soft hum of insects, the gentle rustling of leaves in the breeze. It was everything the barren landscape had not been. He felt an odd sense of calm, as though the worries that had weighed him down earlier had begun to lift. The further he went, the more the path seemed to unfold before him, each step more inviting than the last. And then he saw her. Chapter 3. The Carrot At first, it was just a figure in the distance, walking gracefully along the path. As he drew closer, he could make out her features, a woman, her face strikingly beautiful, her long hair flowing behind her like a river of silk. She moved with an elegance that seemed to belong to another world, and yet here she was, walking down this very road, as if it were meant for her. His heart quickened, though he wasn't sure why. There was something about her that pulled at him, something he couldn't quite place. He glanced back at the crying woman, her expression dark and unreadable. Who is she? he asked almost in a whisper. The crying woman shook her head. You don't want to know. Ignoring the crying woman's warning, he stepped closer to the mysterious figure. As he did, the beauty of the path seemed to intensify. The colors around him became more vibrant, the air warmer, more welcoming. The woman ahead of him looked back over her shoulder, catching his eye for the briefest moment, and smiled. It was a smile that sent a shiver down his spine, though he couldn't understand why. She exuded a sense of effortless charm, something magnetic that drew him toward her. He took another step forward, but this time, something caught his eye. Just beneath the surface of the road, near where his foot landed, there was a crack. It was small, barely noticeable, but it was there, dark and jagged, cutting through the otherwise perfect path. He frowned, bending down to inspect it more closely. The crack seemed to pulse, like a corpse on the verge of bursting, writhing with the grotesque energy of decay. Don't go any further, the crying woman said, her voice growing more urgent. But he was too entranced by the seductress, too drawn to the beauty that surrounded him. He straightened up and continued walking, unaware of the thin web of cracks that had begun to spread behind him. As he continued down the wide path, the vibrant world around him seemed to grow more perfect with each step. The woman ahead of him, the seductress, moved gracefully, her every motion a blend of elegance and allure. Her presence was impossible to ignore. She wore a simple red short sleeve t shirt and black jeans her attire modern and fitting for the inviting landscape they were now traversing. There was something magnetic about her, and he felt himself drawn further in. 
almost against his will. Behind him, the crying woman trailed, her presence a distant shadow. He glanced back at her. Her gaze was fixed on him, filled with concern and silent warnings. She was dressed in weathered, muted clothes, her face still etched with sorrow, and her eyes spoke of something he had yet to understand. She seemed out of place amidst the lush beauty of the wide path. She's beautiful, he murmured, almost to himself. The crying woman said nothing at first, her eyes focused on the seductress. Beauty is not always what it seems, she finally said, her voice heavy with meaning. But he couldn't help himself. He was captivated by the seductress. Her every movement seemed to promise ease and fulfillment. It was as if the lush greenery, the vibrant colors, the perfection of the wide path were all calling to him, making the narrow, distant path seem irrelevant. The cracks in the path beneath his feet, once small and barely noticeable, had begun to grow. They snaked along the ground behind him like dark veins, twisting and splitting the perfect surface of the road he had already traveled. He tried to ignore them, focusing instead on the seductress, who seemed to glow with even more radiance the further they went. But something stirred within him. He glanced again at the crying woman, now trailing far behind. Her presence made him uneasy, and yet, there was something about her that felt true. There's something wrong, isn't there? He asked, his voice barely audible. She nodded, her face grim. Perfection without life, she said quietly. It may look beautiful, but it bears no fruit. His heart raced as her words sank in. He turned back to the seductress, watching her every step. So graceful, so alluring, but there was something missing. There was no warmth in her gaze no realness behind her smile. The perfection he had been so drawn to now seemed almost unnatural, like a hollow image of beauty without substance. She is barren, the crying woman said softly, her voice barely above a whisper. She offers nothing, no life, no creation, only an illusion. He stumbled slightly, his foot catching on a small root jutting from the side of the path. He paused, glancing back at the cracks. They had widened further behind him, revealing something dark writhing within, like decay itself, alive and growing. A chill ran through him. The seductress turned to him, her eyes catching his for the briefest moment. She smiled, but it was not the warm, inviting smile from before. This was different, a smile that seemed forced hollow. You see, she said, her voice smooth and persuasive, there is nothing to fear here only the beauty of what can be yours. Her words washed over him like a spell, and for a moment, he felt the doubt fade. He straightened up, taking another step toward her. The warmth of her presence seemed to envelop him, the air around them sweet and intoxicating. She promised him something, comfort, belonging, happiness. He felt his heart swell with longing. The crying woman's voice broke through the haze, soft but urgent. Look down, look at what lies beneath. He hesitated, shifting his gaze to the ground. The cracks were growing behind him, dark fissures creeping closer with each step forward. Something pulsed within them, maggots and rot, a malignant energy feeding on the decay of what had once seemed beautiful. He looked back at the seductress, her perfect figure now seeming blurred, her beauty unraveling for just an instant. This is not real, he whispered, his voice gaining strength. This beauty, it hides the rot beneath. For the first time, he saw the seductress falter, her smile flickering. She took a step forward, her form wavering, struggling to maintain its beauty. The illusion seemed to weaken, and he felt the pull of the crying woman behind him. You don't have to go with her, the crying woman said, her voice steady. You can still turn away. The narrow path is hidden, but it is there, waiting for those willing to seek it. He nodded, his resolve hardening for a moment. He took a step back, away from the seductress. The air around them grew cooler, the vibrant colors of the wide path fading slightly. He looked back at the crying woman, seeing the sorrow etched in her features, but also the strength. Chapter 4 The Stick From the widening fissures in the ground behind him, Dark shapes began to emerge. 
At first, they were shadows, shifting and writhing like smoke. But as they crawled out of the ground, they took form, twisted, maggot-like beasts with glowing eyes and grotesque, hooked mandibles. Their pale, bloated bodies glistened in the dim light. Their movements deliberate and deadly, like creatures born from the decay itself. They were watching him, waiting, their bodies low to the ground like predators, stalking their prey. A chill ran down his spine. These maggot beasts had been there the whole time, hidden beneath the surface, waiting for him to notice them. Now that he had seen the cracks, they were no longer hiding. The seductive woman's voice cut through the silence, smooth and sweet. There's protection here. Those monsters will devour you if you try to face them, she said, with a feigned concern. They are no threat where we are going. And she moved closer, her voice turning soft, almost pleading. Why struggle? Why sacrifice? There is joy here. There is beauty. Isn't that enough? Her eyes met his, and for a moment, he hesitated. Her words were so tempting. The narrow path was still a mystery, shrouded in uncertainty and struggle. The wide path, even with its cracks and hidden decay, seemed so much easier, so much more inviting. His resolve wavered, and he found himself stepping toward her once more, the allure of her presence overwhelming. The cracks behind him seemed to disappear from his mind, the whispers of the crying woman fading into the background. The seductress's beauty seemed to glow again, her smile now warm, her eyes promising everything he desired. See, she whispered, her voice like honey. This is where you belong. There is no need to turn away. He nodded slowly, the doubt receding as he walked beside her. The air around them grew warm once. More, the vibrant colors returning, and the sweetness of the wide path filled his senses. The crying woman's voice was a distant echo, her presence barely a shadow behind him. And between she and the dreamer great danger lay on the path. He glanced back, and for a moment, he saw her, standing there, her eyes filled with a sorrow that pierced his heart. The cracks on the path behind him were still there, dark and widening, creeping closer. You can still turn back, she called, her voice trembling with emotion. This is not the way. The words struck something deep within him, and he paused again, torn between the two women. The crying woman, her figure fading into the distance, seemed to represent a truth he was not ready to face. He took a deep breath, his heart aching with indecision. He knew he could not stay here forever, caught between them. The seductress offered beauty, comfort, and ease, but the cracks behind him were growing, and the rot beneath the surface was undeniable. The crying woman, with her sorrow and her truth, offered something more, something real, even if it was harder to see. He closed his eyes, trying to drown out the voices, the pull of each path. He had to choose, but the choice seemed impossible. The allure of the seductress, the warmth of the wide path, was so strong. And yet, the crying woman's sorrowful plea echoed in his mind, a reminder of the deeper truth he could not ignore. Slowly, he opened his eyes. He turned back to the seductress, her beauty still radiant, her smile still perfect. It was an unsettling perfection, though. Chapter 5. The Revolution As he stood on the wide road, torn between the growing threat behind him and the allure of what lay ahead, he glanced back to the crying woman once more. The woman who had led him thus far, who had warned him about the path of decay, now seemed like a ghost of her former self. Her once steady presence was diminished, her posture slumped, her clothes tattered and faded. The vibrancy that had once surrounded her was gone, replaced by a dull, colorless landscape. Even the path behind him, which had seemed so wide and inviting when he first passed over it, was cracked and broken, its surface marred by the dark, twisted creatures that now stalked just beyond the edge of his vision. The cracks had grown wider, and the air around it was thick with decay. It was as if the path itself had withered, as though its value had drained away the moment he looked forward. The woman reached out toward him, her voice weak. Don't go further, she pleaded, her tone desperate, 
but her words seemed to fall on deaf ears. She was no longer the strong figure who had warned him of the dangers ahead. Now, she seemed pathetic, her warnings hollow. In contrast, the path before him was alive with color. The trees were lush, their branches heavy with fruit. The air was warm, filled with the sounds of laughter and music, as though a celebration were happening just beyond his reach. This is where you belong, the woman ahead of him whispered, her voice dripping with promise. Not in the faded world behind you, but here, where everything is new, vibrant, full of life. This is the future, the way forward. Why cling to the past when there is so much waiting for you? He felt the pull of her words, the urge to step forward, to join the procession. The path before him seemed worth a hundred times more than the crumbling road behind. It was filled with life, with purpose. Everything he had once valued seemed insignificant compared to what lay ahead. He glanced back one more time, watching as the old path faded into the distance, swallowed by darkness. The monsters that had once been so close now seemed to melt into the shadows, as though they were no longer a threat. What lay ahead was worth so much more. This was no longer about choosing between paths, it was about being part of something greater. The figure in front of him beckoned, promising not just escape from the decay behind, but glory, victory, and power. The old woman's warnings were meaningless now. Tradition was weak, outdated. This was the new way. Pope Pius X once warned us that modernism would offer us a new way forward, but it would be a false path, a path that rejected the traditions and truths of the past in favor of empty promises and superficial progress. One, but that voice was small, and the allure of the new path was overwhelming. In contrast, the path before him was alive with color. The trees were lush, their branches heavy with fruit. The air was warm, filled with the sounds of laughter and music, as though a celebration were happening just beyond his reach. And at the center of it all was a figure, not a king, but a leader, one who shared his power with a council that represented all people. There was no crown, no throne, just a gathering of men and women, standing together as equals, guiding the people forward. The leader was everything the old woman was not. Kind, generous, and full of love for his people. He had been chosen by them, raised from among them, and now stood at their head, not as a ruler, but as a servant of the greater good. Around him were banners that spoke of equality, justice, and love for all, especially for the marginalized, the downtrodden, the ones who had been oppressed by the old ways. Kindness, freedom, love, acceptance, the new woman said. The further he gazed down the vibrant path, the more the old path seemed like a relic, something ancient and useless, something to be left behind. The woman behind him had warned of decay, but now her words seemed oppressive, as though she had been trying to trap him in a world of judgment and cruelty. The monsters and cracks belonged to her world, not the bright, just world that lay ahead. What use is there in looking back, he muttered, more to himself than to anyone else. The new path the obvious right choice. The old woman and the crumbling road behind him were nothing but a reminder of a past that had oppressed the weak, marginalized the poor, and crushed the spirit of freedom. The future was worth so much more. The woman beside him smiled. Exactly, she said, her voice soft but triumphant. The old ways are tired, broken. They hold nothing for you anymore. Only what lies ahead can give you what you seek. He glanced back one more time watching as the old path faded into the distance, swallowed by darkness. The monsters that had once been so close now seemed to melt into the shadows, as though they were no longer a threat. What lay ahead was worth so much more. He turned his gaze back to the leader at the front of the procession. He was not a ruler who commanded from above, but a man who walked among his people, his counsel at his side. Every voice represented. There was no one left behind. Every race, every gender, every background stood together as one. It was a new way forward, one where love, equality, and justice ruled. The past, with its hierarchies, oppression, and cruelty, was nothing but a fading memory. The banners of this new world promise freedom and inclusion for all.
As he stood on the vibrant path, the laughter and music swirling around him, something shifted. For a split second, everything was bright, alive, full of promise. But then, without warning, he saw them. Two children. They lay on the ground, their bodies still, lifeless, their small faces pale, their clothes torn. The image struck him like a bolt, freezing him in place. His breath caught in his throat, and a cold shiver ran down his spine. What would happen to them, he stammered, the question escaping his lips before he could stop himself. And then he heard her. The voice of the old woman, but not as it had been before. No, this voice was different, crackling, twisted, like dry leaves scraping against a stone. The voice had stammered with a deep vernacular, like she came out of some dim-witted small town in the middle of nowhere where the inhabitants weren't smart enough to culturally develop. It crawled into his mind, making the hairs on his neck stand on end. You did it, she hissed, the words dripping with accusation. You killed them. You're going to hell. He recoiled as though struck, his hands clenching into fists. No, I didn't, he whispered, shaking his head. That's not true. Her voice grew louder, harsher. You did it, she repeated, her tone venomous. You left behind what was safe, what kept you in the light. You forsook the natural law that holds life sacred, the law that protects the innocent. One, the image of the children burned into his mind, their still bodies lying in the dust. The old woman's voice cackled again, her words tearing through him like icy blades. The church has spoken of the sanctity of life. Evangelium Vitae declared that every human life, from conception to death, is sacred and inviolable. But you, her voice hissed, you abandoned it. You left it all behind for what? For this path, this false paradise, where human life is cast aside like trash, where progress means sacrificing the innocent for the greater good. 2. His head throbbed with the weight of her words, the pressure of her accusations building inside his chest. The vibrant path in front of him, which had seemed so alive moments ago, began to blur. Fear gripped him, but it wasn't just fear of the children he had seen. It was fear of himself. Shut up, he cried out, gripping the sides of his head. Shut up. For a moment, the laughter, the music, and the beauty around him faded into a dark mist. The children disappeared, and with them, did the old woman's voice. Before he could catch his breath, she was there. Chapter 6 The Kiss The woman ahead of him, the one who had drawn him in with her promises, was suddenly right beside him, her presence overwhelming, her touch electric. She smiled at him, her lips soft as she kissed him, gently on the mouth. The warmth of her kiss seemed to erase the fear, the guilt, the doubt that had crept into his mind. She was the future, and the future was beautiful. Don't listen to her, she whispered, her voice soothing. She's just trying to scare you, to pull you back into the old ways, the ways of oppression of fear. As she spoke, she took his hand and placed it on her waist, her touch firm yet gentle. Look around you. This is where you belong, with us with the people who see the truth. What you saw, the children, their parents were oppressors. They wouldn't submit. They clung to the old ways, and those ways had to die for the new world to rise. They were casualties in a hard-fought war. Her words rang in his ears, louder than the witch's crackling voice. She stroked his hand gently as she spoke. The old woman, she continued, she's the voice of a world long gone, a world where the rich dominated, where the powerful ruled and the weak were trampled. But here, she gestured to the vibrant path around them. Here, we are building something new. The old ways are gone, but for a good reason. He hesitated, his hand still on her waist. But, but the children. They had to go, she said simply. They were part of the old system, a system built on lies and inequality. You're free of that now. We're free of that now. And sometimes hard choices have to be made. Isn't it worth it to build a world where everyone is truly equal? Her words were intoxicating, a bomb against the fear that had gripped him moments before. The old woman's warnings of natural law, 
of human dignity began to fade like distant echoes. This new world was alive, vibrant, full of possibilities. Surely, the sacrifices were justified. The crowd's laughter rippled through the verdant air, a melody that danced among the trees, the broad and gleaming path before them unfurling like a ribbon of untamed promise. The dreamer felt the pull of their joy, the rush of their exuberance, an intoxicating sense of belonging that surged within him, buoyed by the mirth in their eyes and the music in their voices. They sang of new ways, new freedoms, new horizons, where the air itself seemed lighter, unburdened. Their voices wove together, a tapestry of certainty, of untroubled delight. But as the dreamer began to sway with the rhythm of this new world, a thread of memory, thin yet unyielding, tugged at him. The voice of the old woman, distant yet sharp, broke through, like a note from a forgotten song. Few are saved, she had whispered, her voice thick with the weight of ages. He had heard it before many times, but now it seemed a remnant from another life, a distant echo that dissolved into the wind. The crowd, however, remembered well enough, though only to dismiss her. They tossed her warning aside as one might discard a frayed garment, mocking her words with casual ease. Few are saved, someone sneered, their laughter bright harsh. What cruelty! Who could cling to something so bitter, so ancient? A knot began to twist in the dreamer's belly, a small stirring of disquiet, an ember from the path he had once walked. Yet the woman beside him, radiant and irresistible, her eyes full of fire and promise, smiled, a smile that melted like honey. Pay her no mind, she murmured, her words flowing like silk, smooth and soft. Her path is narrow because it was carved by fear. Fear of judgment. Fear of freedom. She clings to those old ways because they keep people small, keep them shackled. But you, you see what lies ahead. No judgment, no punishment. Only release. The crowd swelled with agreement, their nods a tide. Oppression, one voice declared. Her god is a jailer, one who chains, one who condemns. But this new way, it is freedom. Here, we are becoming who we were meant to be. Laughter followed again, bright as sunlight, and the dreamer felt its warmth washing over him. But it was not a lightness he carried. No, the weight that pressed down on him was of a different sort, not the judgment the old woman spoke of, but the pressure of those who rejected it. They mocked what spoke of limits, scorned what demanded sacrifice, derided the narrow road. He could feel the pull, the demand to laugh with them, to cast aside those lingering shadows and join their song. She says few are saved. A voice rang out, sharp with disdain. But what kind of God would carve so narrow a path? Is that love? Is that mercy? The seductive woman leaned into him, her breath warm as a summer breeze, words curling like smoke in his ear. Look at them, she whispered. They are right. This path is broad and wide and for all. We are walking it together. Why cling to an idea that salvation is so difficult, so far from reach? Her words were sweet, tempting as ripened fruit, and the dreamer found himself wanting, desperately, to agree. The old woman's voice, once clear, now felt like chains around him, heavy and cold. The crowd's laughter beckoned him into their light, their joy. Yet still, somewhere deep, the echo remained. Few are saved. It lingered, not like the melody of their mirth, but like a shadow across the heart, stubborn and unyielding. Theological Reflection The seductive woman's words echoed the prevailing beliefs of a world that had distanced itself from the uncomfortable truths of old. The notion that few are saved seemed harsh, offensive, even cruel to modern ears. How could a loving God allow only a few to enter eternal life? Such a thought was an affront to contemporary thinking, which embraced a far more palatable view of salvation. In his work The Way of Salvation and Perfection, St. Alphonsus Liguori spoke plainly of this uncomfortable reality. The greater part of Christians, even among those who practice the faith, will be condemned because they live in sin and persist in it. This sobering truth, though difficult to accept, 
was rooted in the teachings of Christ who warned, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Matthew 7 verses 13 to 14. But the modern world scoffed at such ideas. Pope Pius X, in his encyclical Pacendi Dominici Gregis, warned against the insidious rise of modernism, a heresy that sought to reshape ancient truths to fit the sensibilities of a modern age. Modernism was, as he described, the synthesis of all heresies, a dangerous movement that rejected timeless doctrines in favor of a comfortable, man-centered religion. It promised freedom but led only to confusion and estrangement from God's eternal law. The dreamer now found himself in the midst of this modernist chorus, where the crowd rejected the idea of a narrow path to salvation as cruel and outdated. They believed that salvation should be easy, available to all, with no need for sacrifice or judgment. Yet deep within, the dreamer could not shake the words of the old woman, few are saved. It nodded him, despite the seductive woman's persistent reassurances that there was no judgment on this wide road, only freedom to be who they wanted to be. As the crowd moved forward, their laughter mingling with the wind, the dreamer felt a growing tension. Within him, the old woman's words still echoed in his mind, though they seemed more distant with each step along this path. He wrestled with doubt. Why would God make the way so narrow? Why should salvation be so difficult? And yet, the firmness in the old woman's voice haunted him, and the truth of her warning was not so easily dismissed. The questions only multiplied as the crowd pressed on. How absurd, scoffed a young man nearby. Are we really supposed to believe that someone born into the wrong family, raised in the wrong religion, is automatically condemned to hell? What kind of God would do that? Another voice, sharp and cutting, joined in. And what about love? How could a just God condemn someone just because they love differently or were born with different desires? Does that sound like fairness? These were the questions that stirred within the dreamer as well. The seductive woman sensed his doubt and leaned in closer, her voice as sweet and reassuring as ever. This is exactly what the old woman wants you to believe, she whispered, that you are damned from the start unless you follow her narrow, impossible path. But think about it. How could any loving God condemn someone simply for being born in the wrong place, with the wrong beliefs, or loving in a way that feels natural? The dreamer nodded, the logic of the crowd sweeping over him. It seemed too exclusive, too cruel to be true. How could a path to salvation be so hidden, so limited? The crowd was quick to agree. Exactly, shouted one voice. Look around. So many people are raised in different cultures, different faiths. Are we really supposed to believe that only a small group gets it right and everyone else is lost? And what about love? cried another. Are we really going to say that love, something as pure as who you love, can send you to hell? That's not salvation. That's tyranny. As their laughter grew louder, the dreamer felt the weight of their words pressing on him crumbling the old woman's teaching under the weight of modern reasoning. Salvation could not be so narrow. Could it? How could it be true that the way to life was so hidden, while the way to death was so broad and inviting? Yet even in the midst of their confidence, something within him lingered. Few are saved. It was offensive to those around him, yes. But what if it was true? The seductive woman's reassurances, though comforting, could not completely drown out the shadow of doubt growing in his heart. The way ahead was wide, but the question remained, did it lead to life or to destruction? Theological Reflection The modern world, as it often does, raised objections against the exclusive nature of salvation, dismissing the idea that one specific path, grounded in Christ and his sacraments, could be the sole means of entering eternal life. To many, this notion was not only uncomfortable but downright offensive, challenging their view of fairness. Could it be that one person, merely by virtue of baptism, the Eucharist and the confession of sins, could be saved, while another, ignorant of these truths by circumstance, was lost? Such exclusivity clashed violently with the spirit of the age.
Chapter 7, Karl Rahner In this modern context, many turn to the theology of Karl Rahner, especially his concept of the anonymous Christian. Rahner proposed that those who had not explicitly encountered the gospel could still be saved if they lived according to goodwill, suggesting that all religions carried an implicit relationship with Christ. This idea, popularized after the Second Vatican Council, painted the grace of Christ in broad strokes, stretching it beyond the Church's historical claims. It was comforting, but it sidestepped the radical necessity of Christ's explicit message. But what Rahner and others of his kind failed to grasp was the irreducible centrality of Christ's person and teaching. The scriptures spoke clearly, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 4 verse 12. The church's tradition echoed this urgency. Salvation came through Christ alone, and his path was not broad but narrow, requiring an unwavering adherence to the faith and its demands. The modern mind, however, rejected this in favor of something more inclusive, more tolerant. Yet this inclusivity was not rooted in truth, but in a sentimental desire to avoid discomfort. The Truth of the Narrow Path The dreamer felt the weight of the old woman's words pressing upon him, even as the laughter of the crowd rang louder in his ears. They mocked the notion that few are saved, but deep inside, something stirred, something that whispered that the crowd's seemingly logical arguments were missing the point missing a deeper truth. As he gazed at the crowd, the dreamer began to notice a strange shift. Their faces, once vibrant and alive with enthusiasm, were now taking on an eerie, plastic quality. The laughter, once genuine, began to sound hollow. He realized now that their beliefs, which they wore so confidently, were nothing more than costumes, ready to be shed at the first sign of a change in the wind. The crowd, so certain of their newfound freedoms, had built their identities on shifting sand. They were as quick to abandon the values of today as they had discarded the values of their ancestors. Beneath the surface of their mockery lay an unspoken fear, a fear of holding onto anything real and unchangeable in a world that worshipped constant change. To cling to the past, to hold to eternal truths, was to risk being labeled an outcast. Their faith, such as it was, was ahistorical. It had no roots, no anchor in tradition. Every cause they championed, every belief they shouted about, felt shallow, transient, as though it could be traded for the next fashionable idea in an instant. More disturbing was the way they viewed life itself. Their outward cheer hit a dark, antinatal streak. They talked in whispers of how the world was overpopulated, how bringing children into it was a burden, not a blessing. Beneath the veneer of progressivism, they weren't merely rejecting the past, they were rejecting the future. The dreamer sensed a deep, twisted logic in their laughter. It wasn't just the old way they scorned. They scorned the very principle of life itself. What is the value of anything that changes so quickly, the dreamer thought. Their laughter, once infectious, now felt empty. The faces that surrounded him, once radiant, were masks, concealing a hollow existence. They were bound to the whims of the age, slaves to the shifting tides of popular opinion, unable to see the value in what was unchangeable. In contrast, the dreamer saw now what the old woman had meant. Her path, though narrow and difficult, was anchored in something that transcended the fleeting concerns of the present. It was rooted in Christ in the sacramental life of the church, in the eternal truths that did not bend to the winds of time. The wide road, for all its promises of freedom, was a dead end, a path that led not to life but to destruction, as Christ had warned. Though the crowd reveled in their mockery of salvation's exclusivity, the dreamer felt the growing weight of the old woman's warning. Few are saved. It was a truth the world could not accept but one that resonated more deeply within him now, as he saw the emptiness of the wide road stretching out before him. Theological Reflection Leaning on Evangelium Vitae The seductive woman's words, the crowd's laughter, their shallow beliefs, all of it felt like a thin veneer covering something far more dangerous. It reminded the dreamer of the warning he had once read in Evangelium Vitae. Pope John Paul II had spoken of the culture of death, 
a world where life was no longer valued, where the dignity of the human person was sacrificed on the altar of convenience and progress. He remembered the words, In the name of what are believed to be civil rights, modern society refuses to accept those who are weak, vulnerable, or dependent. One this crowd, with their platitudes about freedom and equality, were not fighting for true dignity. They were pushing for a world where life itself was disposable, where the unborn, the elderly, the infirm were seen as burdens to be discarded. The dreamer could see it now, how quickly the crowd would turn on anyone who stood in the way of their shallow, ever-shifting ideals. It was all connected, their antinatal beliefs, their rejection of the past, their mockery of the old woman's claim that few were saved. It was the same blindness. They couldn't see that the path they were walking was not one of life, but of death. They wanted freedom, but they were enslaved to the very world they claimed to reject. In their rush to escape judgment, they had built a prison of shallow ideas and plastic smiles. Their faith wasn't in something real, but in something malleable, something that could change with the times. And because of that, it had no roots, no depth. The dreamer began to see now why the old woman's words had lingered with him. She had spoken the offensive truth, the one the crowd couldn't bear to hear, that the way of life wasn't broad, wasn't accommodating of every desire, every whim. It was narrow, hard, and rooted in something far older and more permanent than the fleeting causes of the present age. Chapter 8 The Parable As the crowd's laughter filled the air, the dreamer felt the weight of their arguments pulling him down. The mockery of the old woman's doctrine, the idea that few are saved, it all seemed so harsh, so unloving. How could the narrow path be true if it condemned so many? But something stirred inside him, and he began to see the situation differently. He closed his eyes and imagined a scene, a parable that might explain the truth of what the old woman had said. There was an island, and on this island, the people lived comfortably, unaware that the sea was slowly rising around them. They went about their lives, enjoying the pleasures of the island, laughing and celebrating as if nothing was wrong. But little by little, the water crept higher, and soon, it would swallow the island whole. One day, a ship appeared on the horizon. The captain, seeing the rising waters, knew that the island was doomed, and he steered his ship toward it prepared to save those who would come aboard. But when the ship arrived, there was only one ladder, a single narrow way to reach the safety of the deck. The people on the island saw the ship and the ladder, but instead of rushing toward it, they began to argue. Why is there only one ladder, they asked. Why can't there be many ways up to the ship? Why should we have to climb at all? Some looked at the path to the ladder and saw that it led through a dangerous valley where lava flowed and rocks crumbled underfoot. They scoffed. If the captain truly wanted to save us, he wouldn't make it so difficult. Why should we have to risk our lives to reach the ladder? But the captain, knowing the danger of the rising sea, called out to them, pleading with them to come quickly. This is the way, he said. The waters are coming, and soon there will be no escape. Many refused to listen. If the captain really cared, they said, he would make it easier. He would bring the ship closer, or lower the ladder to us. Why should we have to make the effort? But some, seeing the rising waters and trusting in the captain's call, began the difficult journey through the lava-filled valley. The path was harrowing, and many stumbled and fell. But those who persevered, who trusted the captain's words, made it to the ladder and climbed aboard the ship, finding safety from the waters that soon consumed the island. The dreamer opened his eyes the parable still fresh in his mind. He could hear the crowd around him, mocking the narrow path, laughing at the idea that few would be saved. But he saw now that it wasn't about the ease of the path, nor about the number of ladders. The ship was not evil for having only one way aboard. It had come to save those willing to make the journey. The danger was not in the ship, but in the rising waters. The crowd was like the people on the island. They wanted salvation to be easy to fit their terms. They didn't see that it was the world, not the ship, that was condemning them. And God, like the captain, had provided a way out, a way through his son. But the path wasn't meant to be easy. It was meant to be a test, 
a refining fire, a harrowing journey that revealed the true heart of those who walked it, the father of mercy and justice. The dreamer thought back to the crowd's words, how they mocked the idea of a loving God who would make salvation so difficult. They saw God as a Santa Claus figure, someone who existed solely to give gifts and make life easier for his children. But that wasn't the God of the old woman's doctrine. That wasn't the God of Scripture. The God who made this reality was not some benevolent gift giver, handing out presents to those who asked. He was a father, both a God of mercy and a terrible God of justice. And in his great mercy, he had provided a way to salvation through his son. But the path was not an easy one. It was narrow, difficult, filled with trials and suffering. Yet it was the only way to life. The crowd, like the people on the island, didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to accept that God could be both merciful and just. They wanted a God who bent to their will, who made the path easy and accommodated their desires. But the dreamer saw now that this was not the way of the Father. The Father was not subject to his own commandments, as some in the crowd might think. He was the author of them, the creator of the universe. In his wisdom, he had ordained the narrow path, not as a punishment, but as a way of refining those who would follow him. It was through suffering, through perseverance, that the elect were brought to life. The crowd's laughter, their mockery of the old ways, was hollow. They couldn't see the rising waters. Around them, they couldn't see that the world was already drowning, and the path they mocked was the only one that led to life. The hypocrisy of the wide road. The dreamer saw clearly now, the wide road was as demanding as the narrow one, yet it led not to life but death. The crowd mocked the narrow path for its discipline, blind to the fact they had created their own confining system. They spoke of equality, but hidden hierarchies prevailed, casting out anyone who didn't conform. They claimed salvation should be easy, that everyone deserved it, but in their hearts, they knew the truth. Not everyone would be saved, because not everyone would walk the path. The ship wasn't unjust, but those left behind refused to acknowledge the rising waters. The wide road, with its promises of ease and freedom, was a trap, demanding just as much, if not more, but delivering only destruction. Chapter 9. The Wide Narrows The laughter of the crowd faded, leaving only the seductive woman's voice, smooth, confident, and intoxicating. The dreamer found himself drifting further down the wide path, the old woman's warnings now distant and irrelevant in the light of progress. You see, the seductive woman said warmly, the narrow path was too harsh, too demanding. But here, we build something better, together. The dreamer nodded, though doubt lingered. The cruelty of a narrow path still gnawed at him, but her reassurances were so soothing, offering explanations before he could even voice his concerns. I know what you're thinking, she continued. You wonder why not everyone can walk this path with us. But progress requires sacrifice. Some people cling to the old ways and refuse to move forward. We've tried reasoning with them, but sometimes hard decisions have to be made. Her words stirred a strange relief in him. Wasn't it true? Not everyone was ready to embrace the future. The old woman and those like her, stuck in outdated thinking, held everyone back. Maybe they were the ones choosing to be left behind. Theological Reflection The Danger of Justifying Evil for a Perceived Good the seductive woman's reasoning mirrored the justifications of every failed utopia in history. Evangelium Vitae had warned of this, a culture of death that justified evil in the name of progress and convenience. John Paul II wrote of societies that weighed human life not in the image of God, but in its utility to the whole. Life became something to be managed, controlled, and discarded when inconvenient. The dreamer felt the weight of this utilitarian logic pressing on him. The seductive woman's argument seemed so logical. Progress required sacrifices, didn't it? But beneath her words, he recognized the cold, calculating truth. Those who stood in the way were no longer seen as people but as obstacles, and once dehumanized, obstacles could be removed without guilt. A flicker of doubt stirred within him. He wanted to believe her, to trust in the wide road's promises, but something deeper, 
almost buried, warned him that this was a dangerous path. The old woman's words flickered in his memory. Few are saved. Sympathy and slipping into acceptance. Despite his lingering doubts, the seductive woman's logic was compelling. Could it be true that some had to be sacrificed for the greater good? That those clinging to the old ways were hindering progress? The dreamer found himself sympathizing with her argument. The narrow path was hard, demanding. Maybe those unwilling to change simply weren't ready for this new world. He rationalized her view. Wasn't progress worth the sacrifices? The idea offered a strange relief, easing the burden of guilt and doubt. Yet a small voice deep within whispered, Is this progress? or just another way to justify evil. The seductive woman's presence drew him in, her words wrapping around him like a spell. It wasn't just her reasoning that swayed him, it was her approval. He felt a strange satisfaction in her attention, as if being seen by her granted him belonging. Her words softened, becoming more intimate. The old ways were built on control, on fear. But we offer freedom, a world where you can pursue happiness, without the weight of judgment. Her eyes gleamed as she asked, Do you really want to live in a world where your desires are wrong? Where you have to sacrifice everything for some distant, abstract goal? The dreamer hesitated, feeling the pull. The narrow path was unfair, he thought. Why should anyone have to deny themselves happiness? It does seem unfair sometimes, he murmured, his mind clouded by her words. The seduction of the flesh. The seductive woman's voice softened further. The body, the senses, the desires, they aren't wrong. They're natural, they're good. Why should we live in shame, denying what makes life beautiful? She touched his arm lightly, sending a shiver through him. Don't you want to be free? To live without shame, without fear? The dreamer's heart raced. Her words were intoxicating, pulling him toward the freedom she promised. He could feel his own desire stirring, the longing for acceptance, for release from the guilt that had haunted him since the old woman's warning. Her touch lingered, and he felt the pull to surrender. The old ways had been harsh, demanding, but here, there was pleasure, acceptance. Yet, deep within, a faint voice reminded him, the flesh profits nothing. John 6 verse 63. The Illusion of Freedom. The seductive woman smiled wider, sensing his hesitation. You see, there's nothing to fear. The narrow path tells you to sacrifice, but that's not freedom. That's oppression. Her words pressed on him, and for a moment, they seemed right. Yet, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The old woman talked about sacrifice, about the narrow path, about denying the self. He began slowly. The seductive woman laughed softly. Of course she did. But tell me, what kind of life is that? A life of denial and suffering. Her words, so alluring, made him feel foolish for even considering the old woman's warnings. And yet, as he looked into the seductive woman's eyes, he caught a glimpse of something, coldness, a forced smile. For just a moment, her charm faltered, and he saw the hardness beneath. The allure of acceptance. Here, on this path, you can be accepted for who you are, she continued, her tone coaxing. No more shame, no more guilt. Isn't that what everyone wants? Freedom and acceptance. The dreamer swallowed hard. The old woman's warnings felt distant now, nearly irrelevant against the seductive woman's promise of freedom. Her hand on his, her words like honey, made him want to give in. But deep inside, that small voice of resistance still lingered. Freedom without truth is an illusion. Galatians 5 verse 13 As they walked, the dreamer realized it wasn't just the promise of freedom that held him, it was her approval. The seductive woman's gaze, once comforting, now seemed to weigh and measure him, as if determining his worth. Her affection felt conditional, and he began to see that her attention, like everything on this wide road, was transactional. The transaction of value. A line from an old song echoed in his mind. Will you smile in reassurance as you whisper down the phone? Will you send me packing or will you take me home? Now he understood. This was what it felt like to live for the approval of others 
constantly fearing rejection, wondering if he was valuable enough to be kept. He glanced at the seductive woman, her smile warm but her eyes cold. He was valuable to her because he made her look better, just as she added to his worth. Their relationship was a dance, a transaction where both had to play their parts to remain valuable. Was this love? No. But there were monsters he couldn't face behind him and an intoxicating allure in front of him. The dreamer could feel the chains tightening around him, trapping him in a world where value was fleeting, dependent on performance and pleasure, was a siren leading him along. More and more he was realizing that he didn't believe in what he was doing, but the draw of anticipated pleasures and the fear of the horror what was on the path behind him had him locked in submission. Chapter 10 Regret and Dismissal The dreamer sits alone in his small but cozy apartment, bathed in warm sunlight. The peaceful surroundings seem to contrast sharply with the storm inside him. Today, he crossed lines he never thought he would, committing acts that now haunt him. Some will remain buried secrets, locked away forever, but the enormity of what he's done begins to gnaw at him, filling his heart with a deep, chilling horror. He thinks of the woman from the old path, the one who had nudged him toward this moral abyss. Resentment festers within him, a desperate attempt to reject the truth she once offered. If he acknowledges her, he must confront his own betrayal. The apartment, once charming, now feels like a prison, its beauty a thin veil over the cracks that are widening inside him. Each breath feels heavier as guilt presses down on him. The view from the window, cracks in the illusion. He gazes out the window, where sunlight filters over the serene cityscape, but his eyes are drawn to the shadowy edge of the horizon, where the oppressor's ghetto lies. Sealed off by crumbling walls, it represents everything he tried to leave behind, the old ways, moral law, and the voices that condemned. His desires, the sight fills him with revulsion, but also with something deeper, a loathing not just for that place, but for himself. What happened there? His memory is hazy, but the horror of his actions within the ghetto gnaws at him. It's as if a part of his soul was left behind, lost in the shadows of that place, and no amount of denial can erase it. Reflection on the horror of his choices. As the weight of his choices presses down on him, he struggles to return to the comforting lie that he is free. The seductive woman had promised him freedom, but with every step he took on the wide road, the more enslaved he became, enslaved to his desires, to the approval of others, to the hollow facade he upheld. His interactions with her had become transactional, every word and action carefully calculated to stay in her good graces and maintain the crowd's approval. The deeper cracks, a false sense of justice. The dreamer's hatred for the old woman grows, his mind painting her as hateful and judgmental. She represents the narrow path, with its demands for repentance and self-denial. But deep down, he knows the real reason he resents her is that her words expose him. He recalls a teaching of Christ that the old woman once quoted, though he had dismissed it at the time. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16 verse 25. Those words now haunt him. The more he tries to save himself, to protect his image and his reputation, the more lost he becomes. His mind is a storm of regret, denial, and anger. He refuses to see the truth beneath his choices, that the wide road is built on a rejection of the natural law, a rejection of the moral order that holds life together. In rejecting the narrow path, he has rejected the very principles that give life meaning. Now, all that remains is the hollow approval of the crowd and the empty promises of the seductive woman. Conclusion The Depth of Despair As the dreamer looked out at the ghetto, the contrast between his comfortable apartment and the misery beyond the wall was unbearable. He turned away, but the image of the squalor remained etched in his mind. The cracks in his life were widening, and he could no longer deny the truth. Voices had led him to a place of moral and spiritual death. Yet, even as this realization weighed on him, he clung to the lie that there was no hell, no ultimate judgment. He told himself the old woman's worldview was outdated and cruel. But the more he insisted, 
the wider the cracks in his soul grew. The dreamer sat in silence, trapped in his denial, unable to face the truth yet increasingly aware that the wide road was leading him to destruction. He was ensnared in guilt and shame, and the seductive woman had led him there, step by step, under the guise of freedom. The Descent into Mortal Sin Theological Reflection Mortal sin, as St. Alphonsus Liguori once wrote, is like a disease that consumes the soul, separating a person from the grace of God and leaving them in spiritual death. The dreamer had scoffed at such warnings, dismissing them as fear-mongering. But now, he could feel the truth of it. Every step down the wide road had been a step away from life, and now he was lost. St. Alphonsus warned of mortal sin's effects. It darkens the intellect, weakens the will, and leaves one vulnerable to further temptation. The dreamer felt this happening. His mind, once sharp, was now clouded with confusion. His will, once strong, had eroded through indulgence. Worst of all, he was too weak to resist the seductive woman's influence. Each time he tried to pull away, she tightened her grip, sinking him deeper into darkness. St. Louis de Montfort, in Friends of the Cross, described the widening gap between those who follow Christ and those who pursue the world's temptations. The dreamer now felt that gap, an unbridgeable chasm between his former life and the one he now lived. He knew that if he continued, there would be no turning back. Growing Aggression and Fear The weight of his sins pressed heavily on him, and his thoughts turned to the old woman who had once tried to guide him toward the narrow path. He hated her now, hated her for being right. His anger flared as he thought of her warnings, her refusal to indulge his desires. She had been stern, and he had called her cruel, dismissing her as backward. But now, he realized that his hatred for her was a reflection of his own guilt. Fear gnawed at him. The old woman represented the truth he had rejected, a truth that filled him with dread. He had convinced himself her path was too demanding, but deep down, he knew it was the only way that led to life. A knock at the door. A sudden knock startled him from his thoughts. His heart raced as he stood, trying to push away the guilt and anger swirling inside. He knew who it was before he even opened the door, the seductive woman. He hesitated his hand hovering over the knob. He wanted to scream at her, tell her to leave him alone, but instead, he forced a smile, hiding the turmoil within. He opened the door, and she stepped inside with her usual confidence. Wasn't that fun earlier? She asked, her voice light and playful. He nodded, masking the grief gnawing at him. Yeah, he said, his voice hollow. It was fun. Inside, he felt like he was suffocating, but... He couldn't let the mask slip. He had to keep playing the part, pretending he was happy, pretending he was free. The inner dialogue, convincing himself. As she made herself comfortable, the dreamer's mind raced. The cracks in his facade were growing, but he couldn't let them show, not in front of her. He told himself that this was the life he wanted, that the wide road with its promises of pleasure was better than the narrow path. He reminded himself of the old woman's sternness, of the sacrifices she had demanded. The narrow path meant suffering and self-denial. The wide road, with a seductive woman by his side, was easier, more pleasurable. But even as he tried to convince himself, the words felt empty. Her presence, once comforting, now felt like a weight pressing down on him. He could hear her talking, but her words blurred into meaningless noise. He knew the truth, but refused to admit it. He had traded the narrow path for the wide road, and now he was trapped. Her love wasn't real. It was conditional, transactional. He was bound to her, just as she was bound to the approval of the crowd. The depth of his despair. As the woman continued speaking, the dreamer's thoughts drifted to the old woman's warnings. Few are saved, she had said. He had laughed at her then, dismissing her as a relic of the past. But now, her words haunted him. He could feel the widening chasm between the life he had once known and the one he now lived. And he knew that if he continued down this path, there would be no turning back. He looked at the seductive woman, her smile bright and perfect, but behind it, he could see the same cracks that had spread through his own soul. She was trapped, 
just like him, bound to the wide road and its empty promises. He wanted to break free, to turn back to the narrow path, but he didn't know how. The explosion. Suddenly, a deafening explosion rocked the building. The dreamer ducked instinctively, his heart pounding as the walls rattled and dust fell from the ceiling. What the hell is that? He muttered, eyes wide, trying to regain his bearings. His thoughts raced, his ears ringing as he scrambled to his feet. He rushed to the window, but smoke and debris obscured his view. The woman didn't flinch. She sat calmly, unfazed by the chaos. Terrorists, she said, almost casually. They're always making a mess of things. The dreamer blinked, incredulous. Terrorists? What just happened? Yeah, she said with a shrug. There was a bombing. Some part of the building must have been hit. Her tone was nonchalant, as though explosions were just part of the day. The dreamer stared at her, struggling to process her calmness. The section of the building next to theirs had just been blown out, and she was discussing it like they were talking about the weather. But before he could respond, she continued talking, her voice as steady and casual as ever. The duplicity of mind. You know, I have to give them credit, she said with an almost admiring tone. They're dedicated. Everyone loves them, right? They're showing the government how corrupt it is. The dreamer's mind whirled. Wait, what? You support them? His voice wavered, trying to process the contradiction. Of course, she replied casually. Didn't you see the rally? We were all chanting for change. This government is so broken, but these rebels, they're amazing. They're doing what needs to be done. But we were just at a rally supporting the government, he said, disbelief creeping into his voice. How could she not see the contradiction? That's just appearances, she waved off his concern. You show up, you chant for unity, but that doesn't mean you actually support them. The rebels are the real heroes, doing what we're all too scared to do. The dreamer felt the ground shift beneath him. Her words seemed void of any loyalty or belief, just a performance meant to keep her afloat. How could someone cheer for the government while privately praising those who bombed their buildings? Confusion and realization. That doesn't make sense, he muttered under his breath. She laughed. It's not about making sense, it's survival. You play both sides to stay on top. The government, the rebels, it's all the same. Just a game. A chill ran down his spine. The casual duplicity in her voice terrified him. There was no real belief, just hollow gestures. She embodied the wide road's hypocrisy. Everything designed to protect her, regardless of the destruction it caused. Conclusion. The crack widens. As the smoke cleared outside, the dreamer was struck with a terrifying realization. He had been playing the same game, keeping up appearances for the crowd's approval. Now he saw the system for what it was, corrupt, destructive, and eating itself from within. The woman smiled at him, oblivious to his inner turmoil. Don't worry, we'll be fine. We always are. He didn't respond. The explosion had rocked more than just the building. It shattered his understanding of the world. Everything was unraveling. She stood abruptly, excitement lighting her face. You got to see this, she said, pulling him toward the door. He resisted, still shaken, but her enthusiasm was infectious and before long, he found himself following her into the smoke-filled streets. The chaotic streets. The street was filled with people surging toward the ruined building, their chants echoing in unison. Tear it down, tear it down. Tear it down. The same crowd that had cheered the government the day before now screamed for its destruction. The dreamer's heart sank as he was swept into the tide of bodies. Men, women, young and old, chanted with disturbing glee. Some held signs calling for revolution. Others raised their fists in anticipation of chaos. Tear it down, they roared, faces lit with excitement. The seductive woman's enthusiasm. Isn't it beautiful? the woman asked, smiling widely. They're waking up. They're ready to tear it all down. The dreamer struggled to make sense of it. But they supported the government yesterday, he muttered. She laughed. That's how it works. Praise one day, destroy the next. You can't have revolution without chaos. 
The dreamer's stomach twisted. The dissonance was unbearable. How could they switch so easily from loyalty to destruction? And she reveled in it, enjoying the chaos as though it were entertainment. The culmination, government figures among the crowd. Suddenly, something caught his eye. Scattered among the frenzied crowd were familiar faces, government officials. His heart skipped a beat. High-ranking leaders, who had led the rally in support of the system just the day before, were now chanting alongside the mob. Tear it down. Tear it down, they screamed, their faces gleaming with the same excitement as the rest of the crowd. The dreamer's mind reeled. How could the very architects of the system now be calling for its destruction? He turned to the woman, panic in his voice. Do you see them? The government, they're here. They're chanting with the crowd. She smiled, eyes gleaming coldly. Of course they are. Everyone wants to tear it down. It's just the natural order of things. Build it up, tear it down. It's all part of the process. Conclusion, a world without meaning. As the crowd's chants grew louder, the dreamer felt a deep hopelessness settle in. The world he knew, the system he thought he understood was crumbling. The government, the rebels, the crowd, they were all part of the same hollow game, shifting allegiances and destroying without meaning. And yet, despite the madness, he was trapped, pulled along in the current of destruction. Tear it down, tear it down, the voices echoed. The dreamer closed his eyes, the world spiraling into chaos, his heart heavy with the realization that there was no truth left, only a world teetering on the brink of collapse. Chapter 11, The Crime the chants had been ringing in the dreamer's ears for what felt like an eternity. Tear it down. Tear it down. The feverish energy of the crowd was overwhelming, surging like a tidal wave, carrying him along whether he wanted to go or not. But something had changed. The chants were beginning to morph, to take on a darker, more sinister edge. The crowd's excitement wasn't just about tearing down the system anymore. It was about something more visceral, more personal. The dreamer's breath caught in his throat as he saw the shift in the crowd. They were no longer facing the crumbling building. Their eyes had turned elsewhere, toward the ghetto. His pulse quickened as he followed their gaze. The ghetto, the place where those who had been disempowered, punished, and left with nothing lived, was now the focus of their ire. They're the ones, someone in the crowd muttered, and others around him picked up the refrain. They're the ones keeping us oppressed. They're the ones holding us down. The dreamer's stomach turned as he realized what was happening. The crowd, so eager to tear down the system, had now turned its attention to the ghetto's inhabitants, the very people they had tortured and oppressed by day. In their twisted logic, they believed that those who had nothing were responsible for their pain, for the destruction of their lives. The twisted logic of the crowd. The woman, still by his side, seemed unbothered by the change in direction. If anything, she seemed pleased, as though this was the inevitable conclusion of their march. Do you see it now? She asked, her voice soft but insistent. They finally understand. The ones who are truly oppressing them are the ones who claim to be the few saved, the ones who hold on to their wealth and property. It's always been about them. The dreamers had spun as the pieces clicked together. The crowd wasn't just angry at the system. They were angry at the people who believed in any form of differentiation. The ghetto's inhabitants, those who had been reduced to nothing, were seen as the enemy because, in the crowd's mind, they were still clinging to something the crowd couldn't have. They believed in things like salvation, in wealth and property, in being part of the elect, in the idea that only a few are saved. They think they're better than us, someone shouted, and the crowd erupted in agreement. The chants grew louder more aggressive. Rip it down. Tear it down. Burn it all. The dreamer felt the blood drain from his face. The crowd was spiraling out of control, driven by a rage that no longer had anything to do with the system or the government. Now, it was about pure destruction, about tearing apart anyone and anything that they believed stood in their way. The dreamer's fear and temptation. For a moment, the dreamer felt the temptation creep in. He felt the pull of the crowd's energy, the seductive power of their rage. It would be so easy to give in, to become part of the madness. After all, wasn't he just as angry, 
just as disillusioned? Hadn't he, too, believed in something only to see it crumble before his eyes? But as the crowd surged forward, their faces twisted in fury, something deep within him recoiled. This wasn't the way. This wasn't right. His fear began to swell, mixing with a growing sense of revulsion. He had been drawn into their movement, but now, as he saw the direction it was headed, he realized just how dangerous it truly was. They weren't just tearing down the system, they were destroying everything. And soon, there would be nothing left. The turn away. The crowd began to move toward the ghetto, their chants growing louder and more violent with every step. The dreamer could feel the tension in the air, the electric crackle of impending violence. His heart raced as he watched the mob push forward, ready to tear apart anyone who stood in their way. But something inside him snapped. He couldn't do this. He couldn't be part of this madness. The selfish impulse to save himself rose up within him, overpowering the fear that had gripped him moments ago. He turned on his heel, away from the ghetto, away from the crowd, and began to push his way back through the masses. The woman's grip on his hand tightened as she realized what he was doing. What are you doing? She demanded, her voice sharp and cold. You can't turn back now. But he didn't answer. He couldn't. His mind was a blur of confusion and fear. But one thing was clear. He couldn't stay here. He couldn't be part of this. With a burst of energy, he pulled his hand free from hers and broke into a run, weaving through the crowd as he made his way back toward the rally's starting point. The chants echoed in his ears, but they grew fainter with every step he took. His lungs burned, his legs ached, but he didn't stop. He couldn't stop. He had to get away from them, from the madness, from the destruction. The return to the starting point. As the dreamer neared the place where the rally had begun, he slowed, his breath coming in ragged gasps. The streets were quieter here, the energy of the crowd far behind him now. But the tension in the air hadn't dissipated. It clung to him, weighing him down with the knowledge of what he had just witnessed. He looked around, taking in the remnants of the rally that had seemed so full of promise just hours ago. Now, it all felt like a distant memory, a lie that he had been foolish enough to believe. The woman was gone. The crowd was far behind him, but the weight of their madness still hung heavy on his shoulders. Conclusion. The path forward. The dreamer stood at the crossroads, his heart pounding in his chest as he stared down the empty street ahead of him. He didn't know where he was going, but one thing was clear. He couldn't go back to the crowd. He couldn't be part of their destruction. But as he stood there, the fear crept back in. He had escaped them for now. But what lay ahead? The path stretched out before him, dark and uncertain. And somewhere, far in the distance, he knew the wasteland awaited. The monsters, the alluring woman, the demons. But he had no choice. He couldn't stay here. He had to keep moving. With a deep breath, the dreamer took a step forward, the shadows of the wasteland looming ahead. Reflections on the bodies. The dreamer found himself walking aimlessly, his feet tracing a path that his mind had yet to fully comprehend. The weight of the crowd's madness still pressed on him, but now that he was free of their immediate presence, his thoughts began to slow, to unravel, to make connections that had been hidden in the frenzy of the moment. He hadn't seen the children again, not since the first time. But their image, the way they had appeared so suddenly, the way the woman's voice had whispered of his damnation, haunted him now more than ever. They had been a flash, a glimpse of something just out of reach, yet now they felt like a thread tying his experiences together, like a warning he had failed to heed. The faces of the children, lying there motionless, seemed to blend with the faces of the people in the ghetto. The dreamer's heart sank as the connection became clear. What he had seen then, in that brief, terrifying vision, had been a foreshadowing of what the crowd was about to do. The bodies of the children, innocent and broken, were the bodies that the crowd would soon make. The realization of innocence. He had never understood it before, not really. The vision of the children had felt like some vague punishment, some abstract consequence for his own sins. But now, as the crowd's violent chants echoed in his memory, he realized the truth. 
Those children weren't just symbols of his guilt. They were real. They represented the people who would be crushed under the weight of the crowd's delusions. The crowd thought they were tearing down an oppressive system, but in reality, they were turning their rage toward the innocent, the powerless, the people who had nothing. They were going to destroy those who had already been destroyed, to kill those who had already been disempowered and pushed to the margins. The dreamer's stomach turned at the thought. He had almost been part of it, almost let himself be swept up in the crowd's fury. And now, the faces of those children, lying helpless on the ground, blended with the faces of the people in the ghetto. He had seen it before, but he hadn't understood it until now. A shift in perspective. As the dreamer walked, the image of the woman, the old woman, began to creep into his thoughts again. He hadn't thought of her in a long time, at least not in any way that wasn't colored by anger and resentment. But now, in the quiet aftermath of the crowd's madness, her warnings began to echo in his mind. She had spoken of salvation, of the narrow path, of the truth that few are saved. At the time, he had hated her for it. He had seen her as a relic of the past, a harsh and judgmental figure who didn't understand the complexity of the world he lived in. But now, as he reflected on the children, on the crowd, on the senseless violence that was about to unfold, he began to wonder if she had been right all along. Not fully right, not yet. He wasn't ready to turn back to her completely, but there was something in her words, something in the way she had looked at him, that now seemed less harsh and more truthful. The idea that few are saved, that the path to life is narrow, it wasn't just a doctrine. It was reality. He had seen it with his own eyes. The crowd, the masses, they were all lost, driven by madness, by violence, by a desire to tear down everything in their path. Reconsidering the woman, the dreamer's thoughts drifted back to the first time he had seen her. She hadn't been an old woman then. No, she had been young, vibrant, full of life. He remembered the way she had looked at him, the way she had spoken to him, as if she could see straight through him, see the parts of himself that he had been trying to hide. But as he had walked further down the wide road, her image had changed. She had become old in his mind, a symbol of everything he wanted to escape. Her warnings, her call to the narrow path, had seemed like chains, like an oppressive force that sought to keep him from experiencing the freedom and pleasure the wide road promised. But now, as he thought about the crowd, about the ghetto, about the bodies of the children, he began to see her in a different light. Perhaps her warnings hadn't been chains after all. Perhaps they had been the only thing keeping him from the destruction that was now unfolding. The change in direction. The dreamer wasn't sure what to think anymore. His mind was still a mess, still reeling from the events of the day. But something had shifted. The image of the old woman no longer filled him with anger. Instead, it filled him with a quiet, nagging doubt. A doubt that maybe, just maybe, she had been right. He wasn't ready to turn back to her to accept everything she had said. But he couldn't deny that her words were beginning to make sense. The narrow path, the idea that few are saved, it wasn't just a concept anymore. It was something he had seen, something he had felt deep in his soul. The dreamer walked on, unsure of where his steps were leading him. But for the first time in a long time, he felt the weight of his decisions pressing down on him, pulling him in a direction he hadn't expected. The faces of the children, the cries of the crowd, the image of the old woman, they all swirled together in his mind, pushing him towards something he wasn't yet ready to face. But he knew, deep down, that he couldn't ignore it forever. The attack. The dreamer sat there, lost in his thoughts. The weight of his realizations pressed down on him, making it hard to focus on anything else. The streets around him were quiet now, the echoes of the crowd's chants fading into the distance. He had felt something stir within him, something that he hadn't expected, the beginnings of a change. But just as that thought began to settle, he was suddenly and violently torn from his reverie. A force hit him from behind, hard, sending him sprawling forward onto the dirty pavement. His hands scraped against the ground, a sharp pain shooting up his arms as he tried to break his fall. His breath was knocked out of him, and for a moment, he lay there, stunned. 
his mind trying to catch up with what had just happened. Hey, a voice snarled from behind him. What's your problem? The dreamer pushed himself up onto his hands and knees, his heart racing. He looked up, and there, standing behind him, were six men. They were tall, looming over him with angry eyes and clenched fists. Their faces were contorted in sneers of disgust, and they stepped closer, their shadows falling over him like a dark cloud. The accusations. Why do you hate us? One of the men growled, his voice low and menacing. He shoved the dreamer again, though this time it was more of a nudge, as though he was testing how much resistance he would get. The dreamer blinked, confused. What, what are you talking about? He stammered, trying to push himself to his feet. But another man shoved him back down before he could stand. Why can't you leave us alone? The second man demanded. Why do you have to be so judgmental? We're just trying to do what's right. Another man chimed in. We're just trying to help. The dreamer opened his mouth to speak, but his words caught in his throat. He didn't know these men, and yet they acted like he had personally wronged them, like he was responsible for their anger. He glanced around, hoping to see the woman, but she was nowhere to be found. He was alone. I, I don't know what you're talking about, the dreamer said, his voice shaky. I didn't. Bullshit. One of the men snapped. You think we don't know? You're just like the rest of them. You think we're wrong. You think we're evil. The dreamer shook his head, trying to protest, but the men weren't listening. They surrounded him, their eyes blazing with anger. Why can't you just be kind? One of them sneered. Why do you have to act like we're doing something wrong? We're just trying to make things better. Why do you have to make us feel like we're the bad guys? The rising tension. The dreamer's mind raced, his heart pounding in his chest. He tried to stand again, but the men wouldn't let him. They kept pushing him down, their voices growing louder, more aggressive with every word. They blamed him for things he hadn't said, for actions he hadn't taken. But in their eyes, he was guilty, simply because he had doubted them. I don't hate you, the dreamer said, his voice weak, barely above a whisper. I just... Liar, one of the men shouted, and this time, his shove sent the dreamer sprawling back onto the ground, harder than before. You think you're better than us. You think we don't see it. The dreamer's head swam, his body aching from the repeated blows. He wanted to give in, to tell them whatever they wanted to hear, if only to make them stop. But something inside him, something small and fragile, refused to break. It was the same part of him that had started to doubt the wide road, the part that had begun to see the cracks in the world around him. I don't think I'm better than you, the dreamer said, his voice shaking but growing stronger with each. Word. But I'm not going to lie to you either. What you're doing, it's wrong. The men froze for a moment, shocked by his defiance. But then their faces twisted in fury. The argument. You don't know anything, one of the men snapped, his voice full of venom. You think you can just stand there and judge us? You think you're righteous, don't you? The dreamer pushed himself up, his hands trembling. I'm not righteous, he said, his voice gaining strength. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stay quiet while you tear everything apart. The men glared at him, their fists clenched, but the dreamer didn't back down. Something inside him had shifted. He had been afraid, afraid of the crowd, of the woman, of everything that had happened. But now, as these men stood before him, accusing him of things he hadn't done. Something in him snapped. I'm not going to apologize for seeing what's wrong, the dreamer said, his voice firm. I'm not going to apologize for thinking that what you're doing is destructive. You're tearing people apart and you don't even care. One of the men let out a bark of laughter. You think we're the ones tearing people apart? You don't get it. We're the ones trying to fix things. The dreamer shook his head. No. You're just making it worse. The blow. The men looked at each other, their faces hardening. They didn't want to hear his words. They wanted to silence him. One of them stepped forward, his hand reaching for something at his side. Before the dreamer could react, the man raised a stone above his head and brought it down with a sickening thud. Pain exploded in the dreamer's skull, and everything went black. Chapter 12, Joining the Oppressors When the dreamer finally came to, his head throbbing with pain, 
He was lying on the cold, hard ground. His vision was blurry, his thoughts disjointed, but as he blinked and looked around, he realized something had changed. He was no longer in the same street. The buildings around him were crumbling, the air thick with the smell of decay. The world had shifted, become darker, more oppressive. And then it hit him, he was in the ghetto. The men were gone. The woman was nowhere to be seen. He was alone, in the heart of the very place the crowd had been marching toward. And as he struggled to sit up, his head still spinning from the blow, he realized that the worst was yet to come. Chapter 12, The Broken Road Pain it was the first thing he felt as consciousness clawed its way back to him. Not the dull, throbbing ache he had experienced before, but a sharp, searing pain that shot through his leg, radiating from his thigh to every nerve in his body, his breath caught in his throat, a strangled gasp escaping his lips as his eyes flew open. The world was blurry, unfocused, but the pain was real, too real. He tried to move, but the moment he shifted, a fresh wave of agony shot through him, stealing the air from his lungs. His leg, something was wrong with his leg. As his vision cleared, he looked down. His right leg was twisted at an unnatural angle, and the sharp protrusion of bone through the skin left little to the imagination. The bone in his calf was shattered. He groaned, his hand instinctively reaching for his leg, but a voice stopped him. Don't move. You'll make it worse. Father Emilian and Franz. The voice was thick with a Slavic accent. The dreamer turned his head slightly, his breath shallow from the pain, and saw a gaunt man kneeling beside him. It was Father Emilian, his hollow eyes filled with a mix of concern and calm acceptance. You've broken your leg, Father Emilian said, his voice steady. Badly. You need to stay still. The dreamer groaned again, unable to form words through the haze of pain. His mind was still spinning, disoriented from both the injury and the events that had led him here. We'll get you to the hospital, Father Emilian continued, glancing over his shoulder. Franz, come quickly. A tall, wiry man appeared from the shadows, his expression serious as he approached. Franz, the name sounded familiar, though the dreamer wasn't sure why. He barely had time to process it before the two men were lifting him carefully onto a makeshift stretcher, crafted from wooden boards and strips of cloth. The movement sent another wave of pain coursing through his body, and the dreamer clenched his teeth, his fingers gripping the sides of the stretcher as tightly as he could. His vision blurred again, spots dancing before his eyes, but he forced himself to stay conscious. The Journey to the Makeshift Hospital the dreamer wasn't sure how long they carried him. Time seemed to stretch and fold in on itself, his awareness coming and going in waves. He caught glimpses of the world around him, makeshift tents, faces blurred by distance, the sound of murmured voices mixing with the wind. Father Emilian and Franz walked steadily, their footsteps crunching on the dirt path, the stretcher swaying slightly with their movements. The dreamer focused on the sound of their steps, using it to ground himself, to keep himself from being swallowed by the pain. Finally, they reached a large tent at the edge of the camp. It wasn't much to look at, a patchwork of tarps and boards held together with ropes and stakes, but inside, it was filled with cots and bandaged bodies. The camp's makeshift hospital. Here, Father Emilian said, nodding to Franz. Together, they lowered the stretcher onto one of the cots, as gently as they could. The dreamer bit back a scream as his leg was jostled, the pain flaring white hot. His body trembled, cold. Sweat beating on his forehead. He wanted to cry out, to ask why this was happening, but the words wouldn't come. A long road ahead. Father Emilian knelt beside the cot, his expression softening as he looked at the dreamer. Rest now, he said quietly. There's nothing more we can do for the moment. Your leg, it will take time. You must be patient. The dreamer nodded weakly, his head lolling to the side as exhaustion began to overtake him. But even as his body sought the refuge of sleep, the pain lingered, a constant reminder of his brokenness. As the world around him began to fade, Father Emilian's voice was the last thing he heard. You have much to face in the days to come, my friend. 
But know this, suffering is not the end. It is only the beginning. As the dreamer drifts into sleep, the darkness of his mind is suddenly pierced by a radiant vision. Before him appears a figure of profound grace and beauty, a woman, clothed in white and gold, standing atop the globe of the moon. She dominates the full orb, her presence majestic and serene, as if in triumph over the cold, lifeless rock beneath her. The moon, often a symbol of madness and mystery, lies subdued under her feet. Her robe flows with soft folds of pure white, trimmed with the rich sheen of golden fabric that glimmers like sunlight. Her hands are gently outstretched, inviting without force, welcoming with a quiet command. Her face is calm, almost divine, radiating a peace that pierces deep into the dreamer's heart. Her eyes, tender and full of understanding, seem to see into the very core of his soul, offering him the silent assurance of hope amidst his fears. Behind her, a blinding halo of golden light radiates outward, as if the very sun itself were shining through her. This is no ordinary light. It is not harsh or scorching, but an all-encompassing brilliance that fills every space, banishing every shadow. In the presence of this light, there is no room for deception. No place for the darkness of lies or confusion. She is clothed in the almighty power of God, truth itself wrapped around her like armor. There is no fear in her, only the quiet confidence of one who knows the victory is already won. She stands as a beacon of clarity, a conqueror over the chaos and madness that so often rules the world. The dreamer feels drawn into the scene, almost overwhelmed by the purity and majesty of what he beholds. The light washes over him, filling him with awe, as if for the first time he is seeing what true power looks like. Not the kind that crushes, but the kind that upholds, protects, and defends. He is held by her gaze, comforted by the knowledge that here, in this moment, he is in the presence of something sacred, something beyond the smallness of his fears. But just as the dreamer begins to let himself be soothed by the vision, the peace is violently shattered. Without warning, a monstrous red dragon's head bursts forth from the darkness, lunging up from below the globe of the moon. Its massive jaws gape wide, teeth like daggers gleaming in the flash of its approach. The contrast is jarring. This grotesque, feral beast, full of malice, surging toward the woman as if to devour her whole. The dreamer's heart seizes with terror. His breath catches in his throat as the serenity of the vision is torn apart by the horrifying presence of the dragon. It comes straight for the woman, and though she remains calm, unwavering in her stance, the dreamer's fear overwhelms him. He gasps awake, his body drenched in cold sweat, his heart pounding as if he had narrowly escaped some unseen danger. The image of the woman, so full of light and power, lingers in his mind even after he wakes. The terror of the dragon's sudden intrusion clings to him, but so does the memory of her, her calm, her victory over the moon, her undeniable connection to a power far greater than anything he had ever known. It was as if, even in the briefness of the vision, she had shown him something beyond words, a glimpse of divine strength, unmarred by fear or doubt standing firm even in the face of the most terrifying evil. Unable to shake the image, the dreamer lies still, staring into the darkness of his room, feeling both the awe and the terror of what he had seen. Gradually, his heart slows, his breath evens out, and despite the lingering fear, sleep begins to overtake him again, pulling him back into the unknown depths of his dream. As the dreamer drifts deeper into sleep, Another image flashes before him. This time, the scene is far more personal, more intimate, and infinitely more chilling. His wife, her blonde hair gently falling over her shoulders, walks up a set of stairs. In her arms, she cradles their baby, her other hand gently guiding their two young children who chatter incessantly, their voices overlapping, pulling at her attention in different directions. The scene is chaotic, but it is a familiar chaos the kind that any parent knows. The half-lit hallway around them flickers softly, shadows dancing along the walls as they ascend, 
their conversations buzzing in a quiet tempest. Then a pause. For exactly 13 seconds, as marked by a clock on the wall above the stairwell, there is stillness, an odd, unsettling silence that hangs in the air as they reach the landing at the top of the stairs. The dreamer watches, frozen, unable to move or warn them. His heart beats faster, sensing something ominous lurking just out of sight. From the kitchen at the base of the stairs, a young man emerges, trim, clean-cut, and dressed in a black suit with sunglasses concealing his eyes, he steps into the hallway with cold, calculated purpose. In his hand gripped firmly is a chainsaw. The dreamer's breath catches in his throat as the man calmly pulls the cord. The engine roars to life, the teeth of the chainsaw vibrating with a low, rumbling growl, its sinister hum reverberating through the walls of the house. The dreamer's wife doesn't turn around. She doesn't hear it, or if she does, she doesn't react. The children continue talking, their innocent voices oblivious to the danger below. The agent takes one slow, deliberate step after another, the chainsaw idling as he walks toward the stairs. Each footfall is a death knell in the dreamer's mind. The dream ends abruptly, the growl of the chainsaw still echoing in the dreamer's ears as he jolts awake. Or at least, he thinks he does but he isn't fully conscious. Instead, he finds himself in a dark, shadowy middle realm, halfway between sleep and waking. The blackness stretches in all directions, enveloping him, pressing against his mind like a suffocating fog. He can't move. He's trapped in this in-between space, unsure of where he is or if he's even truly awake. And then, a voice cuts through the void. Low, cold, and unyielding, it speaks as if from everywhere and nowhere all at once. These are the consequences of your opposition to the wide road. The words settle over him like a shroud. At first, he rejects them, shaking his head in disbelief, clinging to the hope that it's just another dream, just another figment of his overactive mind. But the weight of the threat begins to sink in, like poison slowly working its way into his soul. The voice, so calm, so certain, echoes over and over again in his mind. These are the consequences. The dreamer's resistance falters. His initial defiance gives way to a creeping, gnawing fear, and he begins to sob. Silent tears stream down his face as the terror of it all wraps around him like chains. In the darkness of that middle realm, the haunting melody of a song from earlier whispers into his mind soft and melancholic. Through the fisheye lids of tear-stained eyes, I can hardly escape the shape of this moment in time. Far from flying high in clear blue skies, I'm tumbling down to the hole in the ground where I'll hide. The lyrics float through his mind, each word embedding itself deeper into his soul, wrapping around his thoughts like a tightening grip. The dreamer feels the pull, the weight of it dragging him down, down into despair. As he emerges toward full consciousness, he becomes consumed by a terrifying realization. Unless he gives in, unless he acquiesces to the wide road, this is what will happen to his family. His sobs grow heavier, the image of the agent with a chainsaw burned into his mind, the sound of it still rumbling in his ears. He's convinced now, utterly convinced, that the only way to protect his wife and children is to submit, to yield to abandon his resistance and walk the wide road. But somewhere, deep beneath the surface, a flicker of doubt remains. Buried under the fear and the tears, a small, fragile voice whispers that this is all a lie, a deception meant to break him. But in this moment, the fear is too strong, too overwhelming. And so, the dreamer wakes fully, the weight of the choice before him heavier than ever. The dreamer stirred slowly, the sensation of dull pain pulling him from the dark recesses of sleep, as his. Awareness sharpened, the searing pain in his leg returned, forcing a groan from his lips. His eyes fluttered open, the world still a blur, but the scent of rot and decay filled his nostrils. The stench of the nearby garbage dump, where the people scavenged for food, was heavy in the air. He blinked a few times his vision clearing enough to see the makeshift hospital around him. 
Cots line the open area, each one occupied by those like him, victims of violence, malnutrition, or disease. The sound of groaning, coughing, and murmured prayers floated through the air, mixing with the distant hum of flies and the rustle of wind. At his side sat Father Emilian, a thin and gaunt man with hollow eyes. His worn, yet compassionate face betrayed the weight of many sorrows, though his hands were gentle as he stirred the thin soup he brought for the dreamer. Chapter 13 The Threat You are having a nightmare, Father Emilian said softly, watching him closely as he began to sit up. I could tell by the way you were tossing in your sleep. The dreamer winced as he tried to adjust, the pain shooting up his leg once more. I, I was, he admitted, his voice hoarse. The dream still clung to his mind, vivid and haunting, but he hesitated to share them. Father Emilian pressed the warm bowl of soup into his hands, urging him to drink. You should eat. You'll need your strength if you're going to recover. The dreamer accepted the bowl, feeling the heat of the soup between his palms. He brought it to his lips, though the taste was little more than a watery broth. Still, it helped ground him, even if the pain made it difficult to focus. What happened to me? The dreamer asked. How did I get here? Father Emilian's face grew somber. You were attacked, left for dead. Some of the men ran over your leg with a vehicle after they threw you to the ground. They did a lot more damage too, bruises, cuts. You've been fevering since we brought you in yesterday. The dreamer tried to process this, though the haze of fever still clouded his mind. He looked around again, at the rows of cots, the people suffering around him. He felt weak, helpless, but something more than the pain gnawed at him. The dreams. They were there, hovering at the edge of his thoughts. I had a dream, he began slowly, not meeting Father Emilian's eyes. Or, maybe it was more than a dream. There was this woman, standing on the moon, clothed in light. His voice wavered as he recounted the scene feeling the weight of the vision. And then this dragon. Father Emilian listened patiently, his hands folded on his lap. The dreamer couldn't bring himself to mention the second dream, the agent, the chainsaw, his family's peril. The fear still gripped him too tightly, and he was ashamed of the hold it had over him. He left that part out, unsure of how to explain the terror gnawing at his mind. I feel like it means something, the dreamer continued his words coming out in a rush, like I'm being told something, called to something. Father Emilian nodded, a knowing look in his eyes. If you feel called, truly called, then it is the voice of God speaking to you. You must listen. But how? The dreamer asked, desperation creeping into his voice. What does it all mean? Father Emilian placed a hand on his shoulder, a grounding presence amidst the chaos. When God speaks, he often speaks in ways that require our heart to interpret. Listen carefully, and if you are moved towards something good, something not sinful, you should follow it. The dreamer fell silent, contemplating the priest's words. The woman, the light, the dragon, it all felt so vivid, so charged with meaning. But the second dream still haunted him, its terror looming over everything. Could he trust himself to follow the first vision? Even as the threat of the second lingered, he took a deep breath, trying to settle his nerves. I'll try, he said at last, though uncertainty still clung to his voice. Good, Father Emilian replied with a soft smile. God gives us these moments to lead us back to him, seek his guidance, and trust that he will show you the way. The dreamer nodded, though his mind was still clouded with confusion. He wasn't sure how to follow this call, or what it even meant in the end. But Father Emilian's words gave him something to hold on to, a thread of hope in the midst of the darkness. As he lay back down on the cot, exhaustion washing over him once again, he tried to focus on the woman in the dream, the light, the warmth, the calm. But in the back of his mind, the sound of the chainsaw's low growl still echoed faintly, a reminder of the fear lurking just beyond the edge of his thoughts. He would have to find a way to follow the vision, but he would also have to face the fear, no matter how much it threatened to consume him. When the dreamer fell into sleep that night, his mind was pulled into a vivid scene. He found himself standing in a vast, golden field stretching to the horizon, 
bathed in the light of the setting sun. The sky was ablaze with hues of orange and gold, casting a warm glow over everything, yet the mood was far from peaceful. The landscape seemed to pulse with something deeper, something ancient and inevitable. Before him stood two women, the first a young, expectant mother, her pregnant belly full and round, cradled protectively by her hands. Her face was serene, though her gaze was cast downward, deep in thought or perhaps in quiet sorrow. She wore a flowing green robe, its fabric draping softly over her form, and her head was covered in a veil, framing her youthful beauty against the dying light of the day. She exuded a sense of purpose, as though she carried not only the weight of new life, but the weight of history itself. Beside her stood an elderly woman, stooped with age, her face weathered by countless years. Her eyes, deeply set and lined with wisdom, stared straight ahead with an unspoken knowledge. She leaned on a wooden staff, her wrinkled hands gripping it tightly. Clad in a dark cloak, her figure was a stark contrast to the pregnant woman beside her. She, too, wore a veil, though hers clung more tightly around her face, shrouding her in an aura of mystery and endurance. The two women stood together, seemingly bound by more than just proximity. They were connected by the cycle of life and death, of youth and age, of promise and fulfillment. The setting sun behind them cast long shadows, making it seem as though time itself was pressing in on them, urging the dreamer to contemplate the mysteries unfolding before him. The older woman's expression spoke of suffering and patience, a reminder of the trials that come with age, while the younger woman embodied hope, renewal, and the burdens yet to come. Together, they represented a continuum, one of life's ceaseless turning, of faith passing from one generation to the next. The dreamer watched, transfixed, as the scene unfolded in slow, deliberate motion. He felt the pull of both women, the promise of the new life carried within the young mother, and the solemn presence of the elder who had seen much and carried the weight of those years with grace. He knew, somehow, that this vision was a reflection of something greater, a truth hidden within the mundane appearance of the two women. The image lingered, the silence between them heavy with unspoken meaning, before fading slowly as the dreamer began to drift deeper into his unconscious mind. When the dreamer fell into sleep that night, the vivid images of the previous dreams began to dissolve, and in their place a new, intense vision unfolded. He found himself inside an old house, familiar yet different, an echo of a place from about ten years ago, one he recognized but with a secret world hidden beneath. The house was ordinary enough on the surface, but beneath it, something else existed, a network of tunnels extending down three or four levels under the basement. This structure was not part of the house he remembered, but in the dream, it felt as real as anything above ground. He was not alone. He moved through these dimly lit tunnels with a group of people, all of them dressed plainly, but there was an air of controlled tension among them. It was like being part of a covert military unit, a defense force operating in secrecy, its purpose concealed from the outside world. They moved cautiously through the tunnels, alert to some unseen danger. Suddenly, a sound echoed from the depths. Another group appeared, emerging from further underground. These were not allies. A gunfight erupted as the two forces clashed in the narrow confines of the tunnel. Bullets ricocheted off the walls, and the air was thick with adrenaline and fear. The dreamer felt the cold grip of terror as he and a woman, also part of his team, ran, fleeing from their pursuers. As they rounded a corner, one of the enemies threw a grenade. The dreamer watched in horror as it bounced off the wall, its trajectory aimed right toward them. But, in a strange twist of fate, the grenade bounced back, rolling toward their pursuers instead. The explosion shook the walls of the tunnel. The blast felt deep in the dreamer's chest, but somehow, they were unharmed. It was as if fate had intervened to protect them in that moment of chaos. The scene shifted. Suddenly, the dreamer was standing outside in the front yard of the house, bathed in bright sunlight. The doors of the house stood wide open, and the light poured in from every angle, illuminating every shadow, 
every corner. He felt a deep sense of relief wash over him. The battle was over. The house was clear. Victory was his. Confident, he pulled out a phone and called someone, the details of who were fuzzy in his mind. It's all done, he said, his voice calm. We took care of it. The dreamer hung up, reassured in the moment that everything was safe. But as he stood there in the yard, basking in the daylight, something caught his eye. Through the open doorway, he saw shadows shifting inside the house. A sinking feeling settled in his stomach. Despite the brightness of the day, despite the open doors, there were still dark corners inside. Shadows clung to the interior walls, lingering like unwelcome guests. A wave of doubt washed over him. Had the battle truly been won? Could he really be sure that the house was clear, that there were no lurking dangers hidden in the darkness? The dreamer's confidence wavered as he stared into the house. He realized that even though he had brought light into the house, there were always shadowy corners, places where darkness could hide, places where secrets and deceptions could fester unseen. The very nature of a house, or of any structure, meant to hold and protect, meant that there would always be dark places. And as he stood there, he felt the weight of the spiritual truth settling in. The battle against darkness, both outside and within, was never truly over. There would always be shadows to confront, always hidden corners to illuminate with the light. Even when victory seemed certain, the war continued, subtle and insidious, requiring constant vigilance. He began to wake, the vision fading, but the meaning of it clung to him. The battle for his soul, for his household, for the very essence of his being, was one that required light. Full, unyielding, uncompromising light. And yet, he knew the shadows would never completely disappear. They were part of the fabric of life, part of the very structure of existence. He awoke fully, the memory of the dream lingering in his mind. Father Emilian's words echoed in his thoughts from earlier. If you are called, you must listen to the voice of God. But what voice would he follow? The one that led him into the light, or the one that let him linger in the shadows? The answer was there, somewhere deep within. But he wasn't sure if he was ready to face it yet. The dreamer woke with a heavy heart, the weight of everything he had witnessed and done pressing down on him like a lead blanket. It was as though the clarity he had in the dream, the moment of standing in the light with the house wide open, had all but vanished, replaced by the suffocating darkness of his own memories. There were things, terrible things, that had happened since the rally. Horrors that made his stomach turn and his heart sink deeper into a pit of despair. As the moments ticked by, the full realization of what he had been involved in flooded his mind, and panic began to rise in his chest. He hadn't spoken a word of it to anyone hadn't dared to. But now, as the bile of his own guilt began to rise, he knew there was no other choice. He had to tell Father Emilian every horrifying detail. The thought made his skin crawl, and he could feel himself trembling as he lay in his cot, stewing in his thoughts for hours. His breath quickened, and his fingers gripped the blanket, as though holding on for dear life. But his resolve grew stronger with each passing minute. He couldn't carry this burden anymore. He had to confess. When Father Emilian approached him after making his rounds to the other patients, the dreamer swallowed hard, his throat dry as dust. His voice was weak, but it held the urgency of someone desperate for release. Father, I need to confess, he said, his words barely more than a whisper. Father Emilian's face softened, though his eyes remained steady. He gave a small nod and sat beside the dreamer's cot, placing a hand on his shoulder. There was no judgment in his gaze, only a silent invitation to unburden the soul. The dreamer began to speak, haltingly at first. His voice trembled, and the words stuck in his throat as if they didn't want to come out. But as he pressed on, the dam finally broke, and everything came spilling out. Every horror, every sin. The dreamer's voice cracked as he spoke, the full weight of his deeds pressing down on him with a force that nearly suffocated him. Tears welled up in his eyes, and soon, his confession was broken by quiet sobs. He couldn't stop the tears, couldn't hold back the flood of guilt that overwhelmed him. 
The words became tangled with his sobs, his breath hitching as he spoke. His soul felt raw, laid bare before the priest. Father Emilian listened, his face stoic, but his eyes bore the weight of the dreamer's sorrow. He didn't say a word, only nodded gently at times, his gaze unwavering. As the dreamer poured out his heart, a single tear slid down Father Emilian's cheek, though he quickly composed himself. The tear went unnoticed by the dreamer, but it spoke volumes of the priest's own heart, sharing in the burden of the dreamer's soul, even if only for a moment. The confession lasted for what felt like a lifetime, and when it was finally over, the dreamer collapsed back into his cot, spent and exhausted. But something had changed. Though his body felt weak, his heart was suddenly alive, a flame with a new fire, a fire that had not been there before. It was as though the words of absolution had cleansed not just his sins, but the very core of his being. He felt lighter, his heart no longer weighed down by the horrors of the past. He was forgiven. He was free. Father Emilian stood, his eyes soft but filled with the strength of his faith. Without a word, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small, well-worn prayer book and a rosary. Placing them gently in the dreamer's hands, he gestured to the pages of the book. This will guide you, Father Emilian said softly. The instructions for the rosary are in here. Begin with the prayers. Take your time. The dreamer nodded, his hands shaking slightly as he held the small book and the rosary. He clutched them to his chest as though they were a lifeline, something to hold on to in the aftermath of his confession. Father Emilian gave him a small, reassuring smile before turning to leave, letting the dreamer have his time alone. As the priest walked away, the dreamer opened the book, his fingers tracing the words on the page. He began to read, following the instructions, and with each decade of the rosary, he felt the fire in his heart grow stronger. Tears still came, but this time they were tears of joy, tears of a soul reborn, of someone who had been given a second chance. His heart was full, filled with a love and peace that he had not known in years, perhaps ever. He prayed, weeping softly, feeling the presence of something greater than himself as he whispered the ancient prayers of the rosary. Time passed unnoticed as he alternated between tears and prayer, his soul deep in communion with God. The weight of his sin was gone, and in its place, a new fire had been kindled, a fire that he knew would guide him through whatever came next. The dreamer awoke abruptly, his heart racing as if someone had just violently shaken him awake. His eyes flew open, and he instinctively reached out into the darkness, expecting to feel a hand or see a figure looming over him. But there was no one there. His cot was still, and the deep, quiet rhythm of the sleeping hospital ward remained undisturbed. The other wounded and sick were slumbering deeply, their soft breaths the only sound that filled the space. The air had changed, it was cold now, almost unnaturally so. A chill settled in the pit of his stomach and crawled up his spine, gripping him with an overwhelming sense of dread. He glanced around, his eyes wide, scanning the dim shadows of the makeshift hospital, but nothing seemed out of place. Yet something was wrong, very wrong. A terror, ancient and primal, took hold of him, seeping into his bones and making his skin prickle. It was the kind of fear that went beyond rational thought, an instinctive panic that surged from somewhere deep within, dragging with it every imaginable horror. One by one, terrible scenarios began to sweep through his mind, each more devastating than the last. What if the wide road came back? What if they returned, more brutal this time, to torture the denizens of the ghetto, to finish what they had started? His heart clenched as his thoughts raced further. What if his wife and children faced their fate at the hands of those same merciless forces, and he wasn't there to help them? The image of the agent with the chainsaw flashed before his eyes, and a wave of nausea washed over him. He could see his family helpless, and he was powerless to protect them. And then, a new thought struck him with horrifying clarity. What if Father Emilian knew? What if he had told his wife everything he had confessed? The shame, the guilt, it surged back to the surface, threatening to suffocate him. What if she knew? 
What if everyone knew? What if he had already been betrayed? His terror deepened, gripping him in a vice that squeezed harder and harder with every frantic thought. His breathing quickened, his chest tight, and his hands shook as he fumbled in the darkness. Desperately, he grasped for something, anything, that could help him. And then, through the haze of fear, he remembered the prayer he had learned the day before, the one Father Emelian had shown him in the little prayer book. His trembling lips began to mutter the words, though his voice was barely a whisper. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. As the words fell from his lips, his grip on his fear loosened slightly. The rhythm of the prayer, the sacred words, provided a thin lifeline, something to cling to as the terror threatened to swallow him whole. But then, the stillness of the room was shattered by a voice, a low, guttural sound that slithered into the space, creeping into his ears. The voice was both male and ungendered at once, its tone a twisted mockery. That's right, you better pray. The dreamer froze, his heart skipping a beat. Where had the voice come from? His wide, fearful eyes darted around the room, but nothing stirred. Everyone was still slumbering soundly. He strained his ears, but the room was eerily quiet again. And yet the voice had been real, undeniable, its presence like a knife slicing through the darkness. After a long, agonizing pause, the voice spoke again, this time even lower, more threatening. You are hunted. A cold sweat broke out across the dreamer's forehead. He couldn't breathe. His entire body went rigid with fear. Where did that come from? His mind screamed, but he couldn't find an answer. No one else had stirred. No one else seemed to hear it. The terror was overwhelming now, pulsing through his veins. He tried to calm himself, tried to focus on the prayer again, but the words wouldn't come. All he could do was lie there, paralyzed, every nerve on edge, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But nothing did. The silence returned, and with it, a crushing weight of dread that kept him awake for the rest of the night. His mind raced, his heart pounding in his chest as he lay in the darkness, unable to escape the fear that gripped him. He remained like that, frozen in place, until the pale light of morning finally began to creep in through the makeshift windows, bringing with it a weak sense of relief. But even as dawn broke, the words of the voice echoed in his mind, lingering like a curse. You are hunted. Chapter 14, Letting Go As the early morning light began to filter into the makeshift hospital, it brought with it a subtle warmth that broke through the dreamer's fog of fear. His terror from the night had not fully left him, but in the soft, quiet light of dawn, clarity began to seep in, displacing some of the panic that had held him captive for what felt like hours. Lying there, exhausted but unable to close his eyes, he began to understand that it wasn't the threats themselves that had been torturing him through the night. It wasn't the voice whispering, you are hunted, nor the terrifying visions that had filled his dreams. The true horror, the thing that had pushed him so close to the edge, was the frantic way he had tried to grasp and hold on to everything he feared losing. His mind had been consumed with the need to protect his wife, his children, and his dignity, as though they were treasures to guard at all costs. It hit him then, almost like a revelation, that his panic came not from the events themselves, but from his own desperate need to control them. His terror had sprung from trying to keep his hands clenched around these precious things, afraid that any slight slip would send them spiraling into oblivion. His thoughts had spiraled into fear of torture, humiliation, or loss, but it was the frantic struggle to avoid these possibilities that had torn him apart. Now, in the light of the new day, he began to loosen his grip. He began to realize the futility of holding on so tightly, of letting fear drive him to madness. The horrors, the possibilities that had haunted him, they could come to pass, but the dread of their arrival had only chained him more firmly to the earthly life he needed to let go of. Sanity, he realized, would not come by disbelieving the warnings or pushing away the dangers. It would not come from trying to outthink the threats or plan every possible defense. 
Rather, it would come from acceptance. The threats may or may not be true, the danger's real, but what he had control over was his response. He had a duty to protect those he loved. He had a duty to protect his family, to keep them safe as best as he could. But the gripping, all-consuming panic was not protection, it was bondage. It was his fear of losing them that kept him tied to this world, more than the threats themselves. He resolved, as the morning sun crept further into the room, to believe every voice, to trust that the warnings could be true, that the horrors could come. But in the same breath, he resolved to loosen his manic grip on the treasures he had tried so hard to defend. Let go, a small voice seemed to whisper. He would still fight for his wife, his children, his dignity, but not with the suffocating desperation that had nearly broken him. He would fight with detachment, trusting that God's will was more powerful than his own fear. For the first time since the nightmare had begun, peace began to creep back in. He allowed the possibility of the worst to exist without being swallowed by it. He began to see that true consolation, true freedom, lay not in trying to control every outcome but in trusting fully in God's providence. Whatever came, it would come, and if it came, it would be for his good. Even the horror of it all could become a path toward salvation, if he could let go of his earthly chains and turn his eyes toward heaven. The image of Christ on the cross formed in his mind. The Lord, crucified, had left his mother in the midst of wolves, amidst the hatred and mockery of a world that spat upon him and called him a blasphemer. The accusations, the shame, the humiliation, every fear the dreamer had grappled with had been borne by. Christ. He thought of Mary, standing at the foot of the cross, her son's body broken, his name dishonored, his dignity ripped away by a mob. And yet, Christ had not wavered. He had left everything, his mother, his life, his dignity, in the hands of God the Father. This is what it means to trust, the dreamer thought. Christ had not clung to his life, but gave it up willingly, even though every earthly fear, every horror, had come true. But Christ knew the truth, the real truth, that it wasn't about the loss of earthly things. It was about the promise of resurrection, of life beyond the horrors, beyond the fear. The dreamer let the image settle in his heart. He knew now what he had to do. The threats, the warnings, he wouldn't ignore them, but he wouldn't be bound by them anymore either. They were just shadows, testing his resolve. The true path lay in detachment, in letting go of the frantic need to protect everything as if it were his to control. He closed his eyes, letting a deep breath out. The fear was still there, but now it was different. He was different. He had seen the cross, and in the midst of that image, he had found the strength to surrender. Father Emilian approached the dreamer's cot with a calm, steady presence, resting his hand on the makeshift cast that encased the dreamer's leg. It looks like you're recovering well, he said, his voice quiet but firm. We're going to move you out of here soon. Up where the road begins to narrow, there's a safe haven for believers, where you can hopefully find your grounding. We call it the Survivor City. With that, Father Emilian stood, giving a nod as if to signal the beginning of the next phase in the dreamer's journey. He left without further explanation, leaving the dreamer alone with his thoughts. Survivor City. The name intrigued him, but something about it carried an undertone of both promise and mystery. As the dreamer lay there, staring at the worn fabric of his blanket, he couldn't help but feel a growing mixture of curiosity and unease about what lay ahead. What kind of place was this survivor city? Was it truly a sanctuary? Or another test? Another step in the long and winding road he found himself on? A few minutes later, Franz appeared at the tent entrance, carrying an old pair of crutches that had clearly seen better days. Here, he said gruffly, handing them to the dreamer. You're coming with me now. The dreamer gripped the crutches tightly, pulling himself up despite the weight of his injured leg. Franz didn't offer much in the way of words, his silent efficiency was enough. He motioned for the dreamer to follow him, and they slowly made their way out of the tent and across the camp. As they passed through the rows of cots and small fires, the dreamer noticed the worn faces of the other denizens, people who had come here not just for physical refuge, but to escape something far greater. 
When they reached the edge of the camp, Franz stopped by a parked vehicle, a rusted old tow truck with a crane bolted to the back bed. He grabbed a hat from the truck's cab and, without a word, placed it firmly on the dreamer's head, tucking it down low to shield his face. Inconspicuous, Franz muttered, giving the dreamer a glance that suggested caution. With a grunt, he helped the dreamer climb into the passenger seat, his crutches tucked beside him. The dreamer sank into the worn-up holstery as Franz took the driver's seat, the engine rumbling to life with a low growl. As they drove out of the camp, the dreamer caught fleeting glimpses of the city, towering, fractured buildings looming in the distance, shrouded in haze. The streets were alive, but not in the way one would expect. It wasn't chaos, but there was a pulse to the movement. Figures moving in the shadows, silent exchanges at corners, hushed words passing between strangers. The city seemed to hum with a kind of intrigue, as if everything just out of sight held a secret. Franz navigated through narrow alleyways, avoiding main roads where larger vehicles and groups of people gathered. The dreamer noticed a few checkpoints scattered throughout, manned by city guards, who paid little attention to their passing truck, but every so often a shadowy figure would cast a suspicious glance in their direction. The dreamer kept his head down, thankful for the hat as Franz steered them through side streets and lesser-traveled paths. At one point, they passed by a crowded square where a small gathering of people were listening to a speaker in the center. The man was dressed in nondescript clothes, yet there was a certain fervor in his voice. The dreamer caught fragments of the speech, talk of new freedoms, of roads that weren't meant to stay narrow, of a broader understanding of truth. The crowd cheered, their faces a strange blend of excitement and something more, something unsettling. Franz glanced at the dreamer but said nothing, keeping his eyes on the road as they moved further away from the square. As they left the city center behind, the atmosphere shifted. The towering buildings began to thin, and the landscape grew quieter. The road stretched ahead of them, narrow but not oppressive, more of a passage into the unknown than a trap. The dreamer felt the weight of the transition pressing down on him. This was it. The wide road was fading into the distance, and ahead lay the so-called Survivor City, a place where believers were supposed to find refuge. But there was a tension in the air, something that told the dreamer that his journey wasn't about to get easier. Almost there, Franz said, his voice barely audible over the engine. He shifted gears, and the truck rumbled southward, leaving the remnants of the city behind, the gates fading into the distance. The dreamer gripped the crutches, the city and its secrets disappearing behind him, while the unknown of the survivor's city awaited. Would this truly be a sanctuary? or just another mask hiding a deeper truth. Chapter 15 Survival Franz pulled the tow truck to a stop in front of a low, wide building that looked more like a warehouse than anything else, nestled in the quiet streets of a small town. The dreamer, now fully immersed in this new world, had forgotten that he was still inside a dream. Everything around him felt real. The cool air as he stepped out of the truck, the distant hum of daily life in this strange new place. Franz cut the engine and glanced at the dreamer. His eyes shifted to the prayer book peeking out of the dreamer's pocket, the one Father Emilian had given him back at the camp. Don't forget about that, Franz said in a low voice, almost as if he was reminding himself. Pray your rosary every day. There was a heaviness in his tone, a weight that hadn't been there before. It was concern, a subtle, wordless message that something the dreamer had back at the camp wouldn't be found here. The dreamer could feel it, but he wasn't sure what to make of it. Franz stepped out of the truck and walked around to the passenger side, helping him out with the crutches. As soon as the dreamer stood on his own, a young woman appeared in front of them. She looked fresh-faced and energetic, her eyes bright, as if life held no secrets from her. She was wearing a white t-shirt, and in bold pink letters across the front were the words, Love Wins. Praise Jesus, she exclaimed, smiling warmly at the dreamer. Her enthusiasm was almost overwhelming, her voice light, but filled with certainty. I heard you've received him. Rest in his arms. His comfort is all you need. The dreamer, feeling slightly off balance, glanced back at Franz, 
who simply gave him a nod and a tight-lipped smile before climbing back into the truck. There was a finality to Franz's gesture as though he was handing the dreamer off into a new life, one that carried a different atmosphere, a different set of rules. The concern in Franz's eyes lingered, even as the truck rumbled away, disappearing down the narrow street. This way, the young woman chirped, turning and gesturing for him to follow her into the building. He hobbled behind her, the crutches making soft thuds on the pavement. Inside, the building was plain but clean, with hallways that stretched on into what seemed like endless rooms. The air was warm and smelled faintly of disinfectant, but not unpleasantly so. It felt sterile. This is our homeless shelter, she explained as they walked. But don't worry, we like to think of it as a place of new beginnings. Jesus makes all things new. She turned to look at him with that same wide, cheerful smile, as if no shadow could touch her world. She led him to a small apartment tucked away in one of the corridors. It was simple, a bed, a chair, a small table. On the wall hung a framed picture of Jesus, his arms open wide, smiling warmly, like an old friend welcoming you home. The dreamer felt a stirring inside him. Her words had a softness that appealed to him, even though something about them felt incomplete. He couldn't quite put his finger on it, but there was a skin-deep quality to everything. The smiles, the comforting slogans, the immediate warmth. It was all nice. Too nice. There you go, she said, stepping aside as he entered the room. You're safe here. No need to worry about anything anymore. Just rest in his love. If you need anything, just let us know. We're a community of love here, real love. That's all you need. The dreamer nodded, offering a small smile in return. He didn't disagree with her, but he didn't feel the depth she seemed to project either. Her words felt like an echo of something true, but distant, like a memory of warmth that no longer held any heat. There was nothing to argue with, no reason to push back, but a part of him knew that the comfort she spoke of wasn't the kind Father Emilian had pointed him toward. Thank you, he managed, leaning on his crutches as he stepped inside. She gave him one last smile and a nod before turning away, leaving him alone in the small, quiet apartment. The room felt strangely empty as the door closed behind him. He shifted his weight onto the bed and sat down, feeling the prayer book still pressing against his side. A reminder of the camp, a father a million's firm but quiet guidance. He reached for it, his fingers tracing the worn edges of the book. Rest in his love, she had said. But the dreamer couldn't shake the feeling that what he had been offered was a comfort without substance, a peace without challenge. He felt sympathetic to her. She was kind, after all. But something deeper stirred inside him. Something that whispered there was more than just this. With the room growing still around him, he set the crutches aside and opened the prayer book, feeling the familiar weight of the rosary in his hand. He didn't know what the survivor city held for him yet, but as his fingers moved over the beads, he knew he wasn't going to let go of this, of the real ground beneath his feet. Chapter 16 The Chapel The dreamer sat uneasily in the small chapel, his eyes wandering across the room. The young woman with the love winds. T-shirt sat in the front row, hands clasped, her face glowing with satisfaction. An aged priest stood at the front, finishing a reading from the Gospel of John. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. The priest closed the gospel and gazed out over the congregation, his face a calm mask of serenity. He stepped forward, his voice soft but measured as he began his homily. My dear friends, I want you to look closely at this passage. The priest said gently, Notice what Jesus does here. He does not lecture the woman. He does not scold her. And he does not demand that she change her ways before offering her forgiveness. No. He simply loves her. He embraces her as she is, and he lets her go, free from shame, free from judgment. The dreamer shifted uncomfortably in his seat, 
memories of his recent struggles flickering through his mind. He thought of the times he had resisted temptation, rejected sin, and fought to maintain a sense of purity. The priest's words seemed soft, almost too soft, as if they were skipping over something crucial. Too often, the priest continued, we think we are doing God's work when we go out into the world, trying to tell others how they should live. But my friends, we must ask ourselves, what did Jesus do? Did he go around demanding that people conform to rigid rules, that they should change their lifestyles before they could be accepted? The priest's voice rose slightly, and the dreamer could feel the tension building inside him. He knew the answer the priest was implying, but it didn't sit right with him. No, he did not, the priest said with a shake of his head. Jesus loved people where they were. He did not impose. He did not seek to change them. He simply embraced them with love. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is our mission today. The dreamer's mind began to whirl. He thought about Franz's quiet warning before he had left the camp, the heavy concern in his eyes. He thought about the rosary beads tucked into his pocket. Was this really the message of Christ? Was love really about never confronting, never calling others to a higher standard? The priest's voice softened again, becoming almost mournful. There are some, even today, who believe that it is our duty to go out into the world and convert others. Tell them they are wrong, that they need to change, that they must follow our path. But, my friends, that is not love. That is not the way of Christ. To impose our beliefs on others, to tell them they are lost unless they become like us, is to strip them of their dignity. We are not called to judge, to change others. We are called to accept them as they are. The words hit the dreamer like a wave. The priest's calm tone belied the weight of what he was saying. The dreamer felt his chest tighten. Was he really saying that missionary work, helping others find the truth, was mean-spirited? I tell you, the priest said, his voice now filled with certainty, it is far more important to feed the bodies of those who are hungry than to hurt the feelings of those who may not share our beliefs. God did not send us out to convert the world, to force others to think as we do. He sent us to love, to care for the needy, to offer peace, not confrontation. Bodies need to be fed, not feelings hurt. The dreamer's stomach lurched. Was this really the message? Was this really what Christ meant? The priest's words seemed to contradict everything he had experienced. The struggles to reject selfishness. The constant call to repentance. The priest's tone was soothing, but there was a sharpness underneath, as if the real battle was being avoided. He looked around the chapel. The young woman in the love wins. Shirt was nodding enthusiastically, a peaceful smile on her face. Others in the room seemed similarly comforted, as if the message had lifted a weight from their hearts. But the dreamer felt uneasy. There was something missing, a depth that the priest's words skimmed over, leaving only a hollow sense of ease. The priest's final words echoed in the dreamer's mind. Bodies need to be fed, not feelings hurt. The dreamer felt a pit in his stomach. He knew that feeding the hungry was important, but he also knew that there was more, much more. His mind turned back to the path he had walked, the times he had been tempted, the moments he had turned away from the wide road. Was all of that meaningless? Was it wrong to call others to repentance, to seek the truth in a world filled with lies? Had the priest just invalidated his entire journey? Or was he just trying to be nice, to make the message easier to swallow? The dreamer wasn't sure. But one thing gnawed at him. The nagging feeling that love, real love, was something far more challenging than the peaceful embrace the priest was offering. The homily ended, but the dreamer's thoughts were far from settled. On the second day, the dreamer found himself once again in the small chapel. The atmosphere felt the same as before, soft, comforting, and warm. But now, after the unease of the previous homily, he felt an underlying tension, a heaviness in the air. The young woman with the love wins. Shirt was once again seated in the front row, her posture relaxed, her eyes glowing with serene contentment. The priest stood at the front, his face calm and composed as he finished the reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness 
where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There was a long pause after the reading. The words seemed to hang in the air like a weight, heavy and unmistakable. The dreamer felt the tension rising inside him. He had heard these words before, and they had always struck him with the seriousness of judgment. The outer darkness. It was a vivid image, one that seemed impossible to ignore. The priest approached the lectern, his eyes calm but his voice firm as he began to speak. Bound hand and foot, he repeated, letting the words hang for a moment. Strong words. Disturbing, perhaps, for those of us who believe in a God of love. The dreamer leaned forward slightly, unsure of what the priest was about to say. There was a certain tone to his voice, gentle, yet with an edge of finality. The outer darkness, the priest continued, is not what we often think it is. We have all heard the warnings, haven't we? We've all been told that judgment awaits those who stray, that there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for the sinner. He paused, looking out over the small congregation with a soft smile. But, my friends, I tell you this. The outer darkness is not some place reserved for those who make mistakes. It is not the punishment of those who struggle, who fall, who seek to find their way. No, the outer darkness is both the source and the destination for a different kind of person. Those who believe that making others feel bad about themselves is a virtue. The dreamer's heart skipped a beat. What was he saying? He looked around the room. The young woman in. The front row was nodding gently, her face lit with agreement. The others were silent, waiting for more. Our God, the priest continued, his voice growing more impassioned, is a God of love, of mercy, of tenderness. And yet, how often do we encounter those who believe they are doing God's will by judging others, by pointing fingers, by making others feel ashamed of their lives, their struggles, their sins? The priest shook his head slowly, his eyes filled with compassion. That is not the way of Christ. Christ did not come to bind us in fear, to shame us into submission. He came to free us, to offer us love, comfort, and peace. The dreamer felt a growing sense of unease. Had he been wrong all along? The struggle to reject sin, the call to live a life of purity, was it all just a misguided attempt to make others feel bad? If you, the priest said, his voice dropping to a near whisper, are not giving comfort to those in sin, but instead are an agent of hatred and pain, then expect to go where you deserve to be, the outer darkness. The words hit the dreamer like a blow. He sat frozen, trying to make sense of what he was hearing. The priest's message seemed so certain, so filled with compassion, but something about it felt twisted. Was the priest really saying that the call to repentance was hatred? That to speak the truth about sin was an act of cruelty? The dreamer's thoughts raced. But what about the narrow road? What about the daily struggle to avoid sin? The prayers for strength? The rejection of selfish desires? Was it all just an illusion? An attempt to hurt others in the name of righteousness? The priest smiled softly at the congregation. Our God is a God of love. And love, my dear friends, does not come with judgment. It comes with open arms, with acceptance, with peace. If we are not offering that to the world, then we are not living as Christ has called us to live. The dreamer's chest tightened. The homily was over, but the tension remained. Was the priest right? Was the outer darkness truly reserved for those who dared to speak uncomfortable truths? He glanced down at the prayer book still resting in his pocket, his fingers brushing over the rosary beads hidden inside. The words of the priest echoed in his mind, but somewhere deep within him, a quiet voice whispered a different truth. The dreamer sat in the chapel, still reeling from the priest's homily. The message of comfort and non-judgment rang hollow in his ears, but there was something else gnawing at him. The couple in the back row, the young woman in the black veil, her head bowed low in prayer, sat next to her husband, who had a clean-cut appearance. Their quiet reverence stood in stark contrast to the mood of the room. Their features suggested they might be from the Middle East, perhaps Syria. Throughout the service, the dreamer had noticed how the priest's glances, seemingly full of compassion for the rest of the congregation, would turn sharp whenever they landed on this couple. When the time came for communion, 
The dreamer watched as the elderly congregants filed to the front with their hands outstretched to receive the wafer, the body of Christ. They took it without much thought, quickly placing it in their mouths as they turned back to their seats. But the couple was different. As they approached the front, they did not merely stand and receive. Instead, they fell to their knees, bowing their heads with a solemn reverence that was missing from the rest of the congregation. The dreamer's heart stirred as he watched them. The woman's black veil cascaded over her shoulders as she knelt, her husband beside her, waiting to receive the Eucharist. The priest's expression hardened as he reached them. He placed the wafer on the husband's tongue with calm but clear annoyance. When he turned to the wife, however, his movements were more forceful. With a dramatic motion, he pressed the wafer into her mouth, pushing his fingers against her tongue, causing her head to flinch back. The dreamer held his breath. The tension in the room was palpable. The couple remained composed, returning to their seats to kneel once again, as if unaffected by the priest's visible disdain. But the dreamer could not shake the sight of the woman's flinch, nor the harshness in the priest's actions. As the mass ended, the dreamer noticed the priest leaving the sanctuary, walking past the couple with an air of annoyance. He seemed to know them well, but said nothing. His face was set in a stern frown, as if their very presence irritated him. The priest didn't even look their way as he passed, though the couple offered him a kind smile and a silent nod as they finished their prayers. Something in the dreamer stirred. He felt a strange compulsion to speak with them, to understand what had just happened. After a moment of hesitation, he approached them cautiously as they rose from their seats. The husband saw him coming and smiled warmly, motioning for him to come closer. The dreamer stopped a few feet away, suddenly unsure of what to say. I, I couldn't help but notice what happened during communion. The dreamer began, his voice low, not wanting to disturb the quiet of the church. I, I've been struggling with everything I've been hearing here. Your reverence, it struck me. It's different from everyone else. The husband stood, his face calm and understanding. He looked at the dreamer with kind eyes. No offense, he said, his voice soft but firm. I don't talk much in church. They walked together, out of the church. The dreamer wasn't offended at all. In fact, he felt relieved. There was something about the man's quiet dignity that reassured him. The woman, now standing beside her husband, smiled softly as well. The husband, sensing the dreamer's hesitation, added, If you're looking for more than what you've been hearing, I think we can help. There's another mass in town and a different kind of place. Why don't you come with us on Sunday? The dreamer felt the weight of the past few days lifting slightly. Something about this couple, about their quiet reverence, their refusal to be shaken, spoke to a deeper truth that the dreamer had been missing. Without thinking, he nodded. I'd like that, he said. The couple smiled, and the dreamer could feel their warmth and sincerity. As they left the chapel, they turned to the priest, who was lingering near the door, still wearing the same stern expression. The couple greeted him in a friendly fashion, but the priest would not meet their eyes. His frown deepened, and he turned away leaving without a word. The dreamer watched them leave, feeling a growing sense of clarity. Something here didn't sit right, but he knew that he had found something more in this couple, a quiet, steadfast faith that was unshaken by the world around them. And he knew that whatever path they were on, it was closer to the truth than anything he had found in this place. Chapter 17 Recognizing the Rot As the dreamer drifted off to sleep that night, an image began to take shape before his mind, vivid and piercing. He saw a young woman, her face illuminated by a faint, holy light, but her expression was one of deep sorrow. Tears streamed down her cheeks, glistening in the dim light, and the grief etched on her features was palpable, a sorrow that seemed to flow from the depths of her soul. She was crowned with a radiant golden headdress, ornate and intricate, reflecting the brilliance of divinity itself. The rays of the headdress spread out behind her, as though emanating from a divine source, yet they offered no comfort to her heavy heart. In her hand, she held a large, golden crucifix, its surface shimmering with a celestial glow. The weight of the cross appeared heavy, 
but her grip on it was firm, unwavering, as though clinging to the only hope left amidst overwhelming despair. Behind her, the faint outlines of turbulent waters could be seen, a filthy sea threatening to engulf the land with its corruption and impurity. The air was thick with the sense of something sinister spreading across the world. The Virgin's tears fell not just for herself, but for humanity, her grief a reflection of the sorrow of heaven. The delicate flower of virginity, as she represented, was retreating into the shadows, suffocated by the world's descent into moral decay. The golden rays of her headdress extended outward, casting light into the darkness, but the darkness seemed unyielding. She stood firm, however, her gaze both sorrowful and determined. The battle she faced was spiritual, not physical, and it was one that weighed heavily on her soul. As the dreamer looked upon her, words inscribed in the air began to form, their meaning sinking deep into his consciousness. In these times, the 20th century, the atmosphere will be saturated with the spirit of impurity, which, like a filthy sea, will engulf the streets, squares, and public places with an astonishing liberty. There will be almost no virgin souls left in the world. The words seemed to flow from the depths of her sorrow, as if they had been carved into her heart. Without virginity, it would be necessary for fire from heaven to fall upon these lands to purify them. The dreamer's heart ached as he witnessed her tears, her warnings echoing in his mind. She was a symbol of something lost, a purity and innocence that the world had forsaken. And in the midst of her sorrow, she carried a heavy truth. Children's innocence will scarcely be found, and in this new era, vocations to the priesthood will be lost, resulting in a great calamity. Priests, as much as laypersons, will fall into moral decadence. Children's souls will become the morsels to regale the devil. Her tears, a reflection of heaven's sorrow, continued to fall, and the weight of the image pressed heavily on the dreamer's heart. As she stood firm, clutching the golden cross, the light from her headdress flickered dimly, fighting against the ever-encroaching darkness. The dreamer awoke with a start, the vision burning in his mind, but the words of the image remained clear. It will be difficult to receive the sacraments of baptism, of holy communion and confirmation. The weight of this truth left him cold and restless as the night stretched on. The dreamer fell into another uneasy slumber. This time, he found himself standing in a magnificent cathedral, grander than any he had ever seen. The nave was packed wall to wall with people, as though it were Christmas or Easter Mass, when the church filled beyond capacity. The air was thick with the familiar scent of incense and candle wax, and the soft murmur of prayers echoed in the vaulted ceilings above. He was with his wife, her black veil draped over her head like a shield, and his daughters, their white veils resting lightly on their hair. They moved as a family, a small procession amidst the masses, making their way toward the altar for communion. All around him, he noticed people receiving the Eucharist in their hands, just as he had witnessed earlier. It felt detached, almost mechanical. As they reached the front of the cathedral, the dreamer led his family to kneel in a line, showing reverence before the Lord. He knelt just a foot shy of where the priest stood, perhaps out of an unconscious hesitation, or maybe out of instinct, but the distance felt significant. His wife and daughters knelt beside him in perfect reverence, their veils falling softly around them like halos of purity. His youngest daughter, only six, was close by, the innocence of her small frame accentuated by the whiteness of her veil. There was silence. The dreamer looked up at the priest, expecting him to take a step forward and offer the Eucharist. But the priest simply stood there. His face was calm, showing neither malice nor compassion, just a pleasant, disinterested expression. Seconds ticked by, first five, then ten, and the priest still did not move. The dreamer's heart began to beat faster. He remained in place, kneeling, waiting for the priest to come to him. But the priest did nothing. The dreamer's hands tightened in discomfort, his body frozen in that moment of expectation. He couldn't understand why the priest remained so still, so neutral, as though he had no part in the moment at all. 
The weight of the silence grew heavier, oppressive. Finally, he realized there was no other resolution. He would have to move forward. With a heavy heart and deep humility, he resolved to crawl forward on his knees. As he lifted one knee, the first movement to close the gap between him and the priest, a sharp sound pierced the silence. Laughter. It began with a single woman's voice behind him, a burst of laughter cutting through the sanctity of the cathedral. Then, more voices joined in, laughter spreading like wildfire through the congregation. Within seconds, the entire cathedral was filled with the mocking sound, echoing off the grand marble walls, amplifying the cruelty. The dreamer's heart sank. He heard his daughter's small voice beside him, trembling with fear and shame. They're laughing at us. His throat tightened, but he forced himself to remain calm for her sake. Just ignore it, he said softly, though the words felt hollow amidst the cruel cacophony around them. He lurched forward once more, determined to complete the act of faith. Finally, the priest placed the host on his tongue with the same disinterested expression. The dreamer received communion, but the air still buzzed with laughter, the sound clinging to him as the dream began to fade. He awoke, not in a rush of panic, but in a state of half-awareness, his mind foggy with exhaustion. He was back in his cot, but his thoughts lingered on the dream. His heart felt heavy as he replayed the scene over and over, particularly the priest's expression, so calm, so neutral, so unmoved. No malice, no kindness, just an enabler of his humiliation. The indifference cut deeper than outright hatred could have, leaving the dreamer with a profound sense of sorrow. He lay there, unable to shake the feeling that something essential had been exposed to him, that this was not merely a dream, but a revelation of the world around him. The cruelty of the crowd was obvious, but the cold neutrality of the priest, standing by, allowing such a thing to happen without the slightest reaction, was the most painful part. As he drifted between sleep and wakefulness, his mind wrestled with the meaning of the priest's expression. The laughter of the congregation still echoed faintly in his ears, and he wondered whether he could ever truly shake the shame it brought him. Chapter 18, Tradition As the dreamer entered the church for the traditional Latin mass, the contrast from his recent experiences was immediate. The church was packed with young families, the air filled with the sounds of infants crying intermittently, yet no one seemed bothered. There was reverence, a stillness beneath the murmurs of the faithful and the soft echoes of the babies. People knelt in prayer with purpose, not as a social gesture, but as an act of deep devotion. The altar stood in front, and the priest, robed in solemnity, faced away from the congregation. He was like a general leading his troops, focused, steadfast, guiding them not to a better future as the world might see it, but to a spiritual battlefield. The Mass began, and the dreamer opened the little booklet he had been given, noticing how different it felt from the others. Each Latin phrase had a corresponding English translation, but what struck him most was the weight of the prayers. These weren't casual invocations or polite requests for blessings. They were full of penitence, serious, and deeply moving. It was as though the priest was leading them in prayer not because it was a ritual, but because he believed, heart and soul, that every word mattered that it was life or death. The dreamer felt it, too. The prayers were like hammers, striking the hard, cold stone of his heart. It wasn't just about looking forward to a better future or improving oneself in the world sense. It was about preparing the soul for eternity, about recognizing sin and its cost. It was real. Every word. He looked around at the dozens of veiled women and girls, some with their small children tucked close to them, the men and boys, all cleanly dressed, stood and knelt in reverence on both sides of the church, their posture calm but filled with devotion. This wasn't just a gathering of people. It felt like an army of the faithful, united in their humility and purpose. The scripture for the homily pierced through the air with force. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. The priest's voice was firm and uncompromising, and the words echoed like a challenge a call to radical transformation. It was a homily straight from the heart of the saints, one that could have been given by St. Alphonsus Liguori himself. 
There was no room for comfortable compromise or justifying one's sins. Sin was to be eradicated, no matter the cost. The priest spoke of the necessity of mortification, of penance, of a willingness to suffer for Christ. He told them that to love God required sacrifice, real sacrifice, and that without it, they would be lost. He gave the example of plucking out the eye that causes sin, not as a literal instruction but as a call to take radical steps to cut sin out of their lives. He spoke of the danger of attachment to worldly pleasures, of how souls are lost every day because of complacency, laziness, or fear of letting go of what entangles them. The dreamer listened, and as he did, he felt something stir within him. It was like the morning of his conversion all over again. He could feel the warmth of consolation settle over his heart. The words of the homily brought him clarity, as though a veil had been lifted from his own understanding. This was the faith he had been searching for, one that didn't merely ask for improvement, but demanded transformation. He looked inward, recognizing the places in his heart that were still hard, the places where sin had taken root. He had been trying to preserve his dignity, his safety, his comfort, but at the cost of his soul. He had been afraid to give it all, to surrender completely to God. But now, here in the midst of this solemn Mass, he saw it clearly. The words of the homily continued to resonate in his mind. Make yourself a tabernacle where the Holy Spirit is willing to dwell. The dreamer knew he had much to improve, but he felt hope, hope that through penance, through mortification, through the help of God's grace, he could become that tabernacle. The Spirit was willing to dwell in him, if only he would prepare a place in his heart worthy of it. As the priest concluded his homily, the dreamer bowed his head in prayer, filled with both sorrow for his past sins and a renewed desire to grow in holiness. There was work to be done, but for the first time in a long time, he felt a peace deep within his soul, the peace that comes from knowing he was on the right path. He was no longer adrift. He had found the road back, and it was narrow, but it was the one that led to life. The dreamer sat in the shelter's dining hall, the sounds of plates clattering and low conversations filling the air. His crutches leaned against his leg as he slowly ate his meal, his mind still lingering on the mornings. The warmth and clarity he had felt at the Latin Mass still lingered, even here. But now he was back in the world of the shelter, surrounded by those whose faith, though sincere, often lacked the same depth of conviction that he had witnessed earlier that day. Across from him sat his friend, a man with whom he had shared many conversations over the past few weeks. They had bonded quickly, both seeking something deeper in their spiritual journeys, though they often disagreed on key points. Tonight, the conversation had drifted, as it often did, toward the state of the church. His friend was in the middle of a familiar argument, one he had rehearsed many times before. You know, he said, pausing to take a sip of his coffee. I like conservative. I think it's the right way to go, but I don't consider myself a traditionalist. The dreamer raised an eyebrow. He had heard this line before, but never quite understood the distinction his friend was trying to make. What's the difference in your mind? He asked, curious, but already feeling the tension rise within him. His friend leaned back in his chair, crossing his arms. Conservative Catholics, they're the ones who defend the teachings of the church, who stand against all this modern nonsense. But the traditionalists? They're stuck in the past, clinging to all these outdated practices. I don't think we need to go back to Latin mass or veils or anything like that. The church needs to move forward, not backward. The dreamer set his fork down, his gaze steady. He could feel the familiar pressure in these words, the subtle signaling, the gentle reassurance that his friend was trying to maintain a safe position. It wasn't just an opinion. It was a declaration of belonging, of aligning with the mainstream. His friend wasn't just defending a theological point. He was defending a place in the crowd, where it was safe and normal, where his beliefs wouldn't attract suspicion or conflict. I don't know if I agree with that, the dreamer said, his voice measured. You can't just reduce the church to being conservative or liberal. The church is built on three legs, scripture, the magisterium, and tradition. You can't ignore one just because it feels out of step with the world today. His friend's expression shifted slightly, a hint of defensiveness creeping in. 
I'm not ignoring tradition. I just don't think we need to live in the past. We have the Pope. We have the bishops. The magisterium guides us now. Why should we cling to these old ways? Aren't they just a distraction from the real work of the church today? Feeding the poor, spreading the gospel. The dreamer could feel the gulf widening between them, though they were both trying to tread carefully. Tradition isn't just the past, he said, his tone soft but firm. It's a living part of the church. It's the continuity of faith handed down through the centuries. It's how we stay connected to the roots of our faith. Without tradition, how do we even know what the church teaches? How do we know who Christ is or what the sacraments mean? His friend leaned forward, his brow furrowed. But what if the Pope says something? What if he makes a statement tomorrow that proves the church has been wrong all along? Wouldn't that shake your faith in tradition? The dreamer thought for a moment, considering how to respond. His friend often brought this up, the constant worry that one day, the Pope might say something that would challenge everything. It was a fear he didn't share, though he understood the concern. The Pope's authority is important, he said carefully, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's tied to scripture and tradition. The magisterium can't contradict what has always been taught. If something seems new or out of step, we have to look to tradition to understand it. His friend shook his head, a look of frustration crossing his face. You're making it sound like tradition is infallible. The church has to be able to change, to adapt. Otherwise, we're just stuck in the past. The dreamer felt the urge to push back harder, but he stopped himself. His friend wasn't just defending an intellectual position. He was signaling, drawing boundaries around what was acceptable, what would keep him safe in the eyes of others. The dreamer could see it clearly now, the same feature he had seen so many times in Defenders of the Wide Road. His friend wanted to belong, to be part of the church, but in a way that didn't make him stand out, that didn't challenge the comfortable status quo. There's a difference between change and continuity, the dreamer said, choosing his words carefully. The church has always grown and developed, but it's never abandoned what came before. Tradition isn't a relic. It's not about going back to Latin or veils or some golden age. It's about preserving the truth that was handed down to us by Christ and the apostles. His friend looked down at his plate, silent for a moment. When he spoke again, his voice was quieter, more contemplative. I just don't want to be stuck in a church that's out of touch with the world. The dreamer nodded. But maybe it's not about the church keeping up with the world. Maybe it's about the church helping the world to remember what really matters. His friend didn't respond right away, and the dreamer didn't push further. They finished their meal in relative silence, each lost in their own thoughts. But the dreamer couldn't shake the feeling that his friend's argument wasn't about theology at all. It was about fear, the fear of standing apart, of being labeled as different or extreme. It was the same feature he had seen on the wide road, where people signaled their loyalty to what was safe, what was accepted. As he finished his meal, the dreamer reflected on his own journey, how he had once sought comfort and safety, how he had tried to belong. But now, after everything he had seen, he knew that true faith wasn't about finding a comfortable place in the crowd. It was about walking the narrow road, no matter where it led, no matter how much it cost. And tradition, he realized, was not a burden but a compass, pointing the way forward in a world that had lost its way. As the dreamer sat alone in his room later that evening, the echoes of the conversation with his friend weighed heavily on his mind. He had grown fond of the man, even admired him in certain ways, but their discussion left a gnawing sense of unease. The way his friend danced around tradition, the way he signaled safety rather than conviction, it was familiar, yet troubling. The arguments sounded reasonable, but something in them seemed evasive, as though a vital truth was being obscured, twisted just enough to feel comforting but incomplete. His thoughts turned to a sermon he once heard from St. Alphonsus Liguori, a voice from the past whose clarity often cut through the confusion of modern thought. In that sermon, St. Alphonsus had spoken of the absolute necessity of being in a state of grace. He had been uncompromising in his words, describing how, without grace, a person could do no real good, regardless of their intentions. The dreamer remembered how the saint had connected this to the very words of Christ. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus had said to Peter, 
one of his closest followers, when Peter had tried to dissuade him from the cross. And later, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. The dreamer had always been struck by these words. Peter, the rock on whom the church was to be built, had needed conversion. He had needed to be brought fully into grace before he could lead others. And in the same way, the dreamer now saw that without that inner conversion, without the state of grace, a person, no matter how well-meaning, could be dangerously misguided. They could even become a tool of the enemy without realizing it. A man cannot serve two masters, Christ had warned. He will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. There was no middle ground. Either you were fully given to God, or you were unknowingly advancing the work of Satan. The dreamer felt a chill run through him as he began to connect this with a conversation he'd had earlier. His friend's argument had seemed logical, even compassionate on the surface. But now he realized how subtly dangerous it was. His friend, for all his conservatism, had been missing something crucial. There was a lack of urgency in the way he spoke about sin, a casualness that belied the deeper reality of the spiritual life. His friend had no sense of the battle that raged over every soul, the necessity of frequent confession, of constant vigilance against sin. In fact, he realized his friend's arguments, though spoken softly and reasonably, could just as easily have come from the mouth of someone on the wide road. The refusal to acknowledge the full weight of tradition, the insistence on conservatism, without a commitment to holiness and grace, was little more than a distraction from the real fight. Like a decoy, it led the mind into safety, making it think it was secure, when in fact it was adrift. The dreamer could see it now. The devil is cunning. He doesn't always work in obvious ways, through outright rebellion or heresy. Sometimes, he works through subtle compromises, through half-truths and comfortable lies. He slips into the hearts of men who are not fully committed to the pursuit of holiness, and he uses them, often without their knowing, to lead others astray. Like a hidden decoy in the wilderness, such people, unwittingly or not, can become tools of the enemy, leading others into danger while believing they are doing good. The dreamer's heart sank as he thought about how easily the devil could gain a foothold in those who were not vigilant, how men who did not actively pursue perfection in their personal lives could become snares for others. It wasn't enough to avoid sin. One had to flee from it. It wasn't enough to be conservative or even moral. One had to be actively pursuing grace, living in the sacraments, constantly returning to God through confession and penance. The analogy became clearer in his mind. Every man was either doing the work of God or of Satan at all times. There was no neutral ground. And the more someone ignored the need for conversion, the more they neglected their own need for grace, the more they would drift, until unknowingly, they began doing the devil's work. The dreamer knew this now, and the thought terrified him. It wasn't enough to seem good, or even to do good things. One had to be in a state of grace. One had to be constantly fighting against sin, or else they would become a tool of darkness, hidden from even their own eyes. He resolved then and there, with a newfound clarity, that he would not allow himself to be deceived. He would pursue grace, he would live in the sacraments, and he would not be swayed by arguments that sought to lead him into complacency. And he prayed, in that quiet moment, that his friend might one day see the same truth before it was too late. Chapter 19 A Return to Persecutor's Quarter The dreamer's newfound mobility was a blessing. With the help of crutches, he could now navigate the streets beyond the shelter. Franz had told him about St. Michael the Archangel, an ancient church hidden deep in the heart of the city, surrounded by the poorest neighborhoods. It seemed like a place worth exploring, a step away from the surface-level piety he'd been encountering, and he longed for something deeper. His first journey to St. Michael was not easy. The streets leading to the church were narrow, filled with cracks and littered with debris. Graffiti adorned the sides of rundown buildings, and the smell of exhaust mingled with that of discarded trash. As he moved through the inner city, he observed the people who lived there, faces lined with hardship, some staring blankly, others hustling to survive in ways he could only imagine. Outside a small bodega, two young men stood arguing over a cigarette, 
their voices raised in frustration. One of them was dressed in the faded uniform of a fast food worker, his name tag dangling loosely on his shirt. The other wore an oversized hoodie, his pants sagging and stained. Their conversation was harsh, but the dreamer could hear an undercurrent of desperation. The weight of the city's grind reflected in their words. You think this job's gonna get you anywhere? The man in the hoodie spat. We're all just trying to survive, man. Ain't no way out of here. His friend sighed, taking a long drag from the cigarette before passing it over. I know, man. I know. The dreamer passed them, the exchange leaving a bitter taste in his mouth. He had seen this before, in other parts of the world, in other cities. People worn down by life, trapped in cycles of poverty and hopelessness, their spirits crushed under the weight of despair. He thought about St. Michael, an ancient church standing amidst this brokenness, a remnant of something far older and more enduring than the struggles of this neighborhood. As he approached the church, its gothic spires loomed above him, dark and imposing against the cloudy sky. A sense of reverence filled the air as he crossed the threshold. The church's interior was vast and beautiful, though worn by time. The floors were polished stone, and statues of saints lined the walls, their eyes cast down in solemn prayer. There was an atmosphere of quiet suffering, but also of deep, enduring faith. The congregation at St. Michael was as diverse as the city itself. Elderly women in tattered coats knelt beside young professionals who had wandered in from the more affluent parts of the city. Mothers with small children clung to the edges of pews, their tired faces softened by the candlelight. The dreamer noticed immediately that this was not the polished, smiling crowd of the shelter's mass. These were people living on the margins, people who had suffered and survived. When the time for the homily came, the priest, an older man with a kind face and graying hair, stepped up to the pulpit. His voice was calm, measured, lacking the emotional manipulation of the shelter's priest, but still hinting at a modernist thread. The priest read from the Gospel of Matthew, the words heavy and foreboding, If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. His tone was serious, but as he began to speak, it became clear that his interpretation was not as sharp as the scripture itself. We must be careful with such words, the priest began. Christ was using powerful imagery to show us the severity of sin, yes. But we must also remember that we are human. God does not ask us to live in extremes, to pluck out an eye, to cut away parts of ourselves. That is not what God truly wants. Rather, he desires balance, moderation. The dreamer listened intently, his brow furrowing as the priest continued. Too often, we hear from those who say we must forsake the world entirely, that we must become almost inhuman in our avoidance of sin. But Christ did not ask that of us. He wants us to live fully, to experience joy, beauty, even the pleasures of life. The key is to do so in a way that does not consume us. There it was again, the same subtle message of compromise. The priest wasn't denying the seriousness of sin, but he was softening it, making it easier to swallow. It was reminiscent of what his friend had said. I like conservative, but not traditional. There was a certain appeal to it, a reasonable sounding path of moderation. But something in the dreamer recoiled from this, feeling the same unease he had felt before. The priest's words were not as bold as those he had heard at the shelter, but they still danced around the idea of holiness, never fully committing to the depth of sacrifice and renunciation that he knew was necessary. The priest spoke of beauty and balance, of how we could partake in the pleasures of life without letting them master us. And yet, there was a lack of fire in his words, a lack of urgency. As the mass progressed and the congregation moved forward for communion, the dreamer noticed the diversity of approaches. Some received on the tongue, kneeling reverently before the altar, while others took the host in their hands with casual indifference. The priest, for his part, seemed unconcerned with how people received. There was no preference, no guidance, only a calm acceptance that this, too, was a matter of personal choice. The dreamer found himself kneeling for communion once more, remembering the reverence he had experienced at the Latin Mass. It was strange, being in a place where the old, 
and the new seemed to coexist without tension. And yet, he couldn't help but feel that something was missing. There was no outright rebellion here, no clear defiance, but there was a kind of quiet complacency. After Mass, the dreamer wandered the streets of the inner city again, his mind troubled. He had expected more from St. Michael. The church itself was a relic, a symbol of the faith's endurance in the face of hardship. But the homily, the priest's gentle permissiveness, had left him unsettled. He couldn't help but wonder if this was just another face of the same wide road he had been trying to escape. As he passed a group of homeless men huddled around a fire, he thought again of the sermon from St. Alphonsus, of how easily people could be led astray when they weren't grounded in the pursuit of holiness. The priest's homily had been well-meaning, compassionate even. But where was the fire, the call to conversion? Where was the urgency to turn away from sin and toward God? He looked up at the sky, which was beginning to darken with the setting sun. Perhaps St. Michael was a place for those who were not ready to walk the narrow path, a place of transition, like his own soul, caught between the comforts of the world and the call to holiness. And yet, he knew he could not stay here. Dinner at the shelter had never been quiet, but this particular evening felt more electric than usual. The woman in the Love Winds shirt was across the table from him, beaming with an energy that seemed almost manic. She had already launched into a lively conversation about her day, her hands animated, her voice rising with excitement as she shared stories of feeding the homeless, organizing prayer circles, and spreading the love of Jesus. The dreamer found her enthusiasm both inspiring and exhausting. It was hard not to be drawn into the sheer joy she radiated, but beneath it all, he sensed something else, a certain shallowness, a refusal to engage with the deeper, harder truths of their faith. She was always talking about love, about acceptance, about how Jesus wanted everyone to feel good, to be happy. But there was a part of him that couldn't reconcile this version of Jesus with what he knew to be true. As the meal progressed, their conversation took a turn toward judgment, a topic he had been hesitant to approach. Yet, it had been gnawing at him, especially after his experiences at St. Michael and the shelter's own chapel. He couldn't keep it inside any longer. He needed to say it, even if it would complicate things. So, what do you think happens to the many who reject Christ? I mean, what about those who hear the truth but turn away? He asked, his voice calm but firm. Her eyes flickered with something that wasn't quite fear, but it was close. Concern, not for the lost souls they were discussing, but for him. Her smile wavered slightly before she caught herself, but the dreamer noticed the shift. It was subtle but unmistakable. Oh, well, I think Jesus finds a way for everyone, she replied, her voice still upbeat but now with a hint of defensiveness. He's all about love and forgiveness. I just can't believe that he would condemn anyone. You know, we have to focus on the good, not the bad. It's not about judgment, it's about love. He could see where this was heading. The conversation was starting to feel like a slippery slope, and he was standing at the edge, knowing that any wrong word could send them both tumbling into an argument. But the truth was weighing too heavily on him to stay silent. I understand, he said, choosing his words carefully. But Jesus isn't just about love. There's judgment, too. He's not the kind and gentle lover who will overlook our faults and sins just because others would condemn us. That's not who he is. Her smile faltered again, and this time, she couldn't quite hide the discomfort in her eyes. The dreamer pressed on, knowing full well what he was about to say could change everything. For many people, there's a tendency to imagine Jesus as the perfect lover, boyfriend, or spouse, someone who fills the emotional gaps left by imperfect human relationships. When a partner fails to meet expectations or show affection, it's easy to replace that person with an image of Jesus as the one who won't disappoint, who never neglects, who provides endless affirmation and comfort. It's a comforting thought, but it's also a dangerous misunderstanding of who Christ truly is. This image turns Jesus into a projection of human desires rather than recognizing him as the sovereign God who calls us to repentance and holiness. It creates a belief that the struggles, judgment, 
and discomfort of this life will simply disappear because Jesus, in this imagined role, will overlook our faults and meet us in our desires. It suggests that what is hard now, our failings, our sins, the judgment we feel from others, will all be softened in the presence of this Jesus, who asks nothing difficult of us. But this is not the Jesus of the Gospels. Christ's first command was not one of comfort but of challenge. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4 verse 17 There is no softening of the call to conversion, no gentle dismissal of sin. Jesus doesn't offer a path free from pain or judgment. Instead, he offers a path that requires radical self-denial, discipline, and the carrying of one's own cross. The idea that following him will somehow allow us to avoid the harshness of life's difficulties or that he will serve as an eternal balm for our insecurities is a false comfort, a deception. The popular image of Jesus as a never-demanding, ever-patient friend who overlooks sin is a dangerous chimera, an indulgent fantasy. It doesn't prepare anyone for the reality of judgment, nor does it align with Christ's true message. The true Christ calls us to confront our sins, to face the painful reality of our shortcomings, and to transform through grace, not through avoidance. We are warned repeatedly in Scripture and through the teachings of the Church that clinging to such a deceptive image of Jesus will only lead to destruction. True love, Christ's love, demands much from us. It's not an easy indulgence, but a call to holiness. There was a silence that fell between them like a stone. The woman's eyes, which had been wide with excitement just moments ago, were now steely with restrained fury. It was hidden well. Her smile remained in place, but it was forced, her lips tight, her jaw clenched. The tension in the air was palpable. She sat there for a moment, her smile fading entirely, replaced by an expression that was more akin to pity. But it wasn't the pity of understanding. It was the kind of pity reserved for someone who was lost, someone who had gone off the deep end and needed to be saved from themselves. Well, she said slowly, her voice measured. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. Her smile was back, but it didn't reach her eyes this time. I think Jesus is about love, and that's all that matters. I hope you can see that one day. With that, she stood up from the table, excused herself, and left the room with a bubbly farewell, the forced cheerfulness almost painful to witness. The dreamer watched her go, feeling the weight of what had just happened sink in. He had said what needed to be said, but the cost was immediate. In the days that followed, the change in the shelter was noticeable. It was subtle at first. People would pass him with quick smiles, but they were hollow, their eyes distant. Conversations that had once been full of life and laughter were now clipped and shallow. People still greeted him, but there was a barrier between them now, as if an invisible wall had been erected after that dinner. He was no longer one of them, in their eyes, he was dangerous, a heretic. He had spoken a truth they were not willing to hear, and now they wanted nothing more to do with him. Even the woman with the Love Wins shirt, who had been so full of energy and enthusiasm, avoided him. When their paths crossed, she would smile, but it was the kind of smile you give to someone who is no longer worth engaging with. It was a smile of dismissal. He wasn't angry. In fact, he had expected this. But the loneliness that came with it was harder to bear than he had anticipated. He was surrounded by people, but in their eyes, he was already gone. Insane, maybe. Certainly misguided. Yet, in the quiet moments alone, with only his rosary and his thoughts, the dreamer felt a strange peace. He had done what he had to do, spoken the truth as he saw it, even if it meant being ostracized. And in those moments, he could feel the presence of something greater than himself, something that reassured him that he was on the right path. As he continued to pray, the faces around him became less important. The wide road, with its hollow promises and cheerful smiles, was falling away. And in its place, something far more enduring was beginning to take shape. That night, after several days of isolation, the dreamer finally drifts off into sleep his prayers ending in the same deep silence that had surrounded him for days. As he slips into unconsciousness, a bright, 
ethereal light begins to form in the darkness of his dream. In an instant, the figure of a radiant woman appears before him. She is clothed in a brilliant white robe, cinched with a golden rope, her face both serene and resolute, reflecting an untouchable purity. A crown of soft light encircles her head, and her outstretched arms beckon toward him with an invitation that feels both commanding and compassionate. She stands with her feet resting upon a globe, symbolizing her victory over the world, the flesh, and every shadow of sin. Behind her, a forest rises, green and quiet, contrasting with the overwhelming light emanating from her presence. A phrase loops around the edges of this vision, hanging in the air as though it were a command. Gather the children in this wild country and teach them what is needed for salvation, the catechism, the sign of the cross, and how to approach the sacraments. The image hangs in his vision, clear and unwavering, for what feels like an eternity. The dreamer is struck with an intense longing, both for her and for the message she carries. But before he can even process the significance of her words, the image begins to fade, and as it dissipates, he is left with a sense of duty and a deep reverence. He wakes with a start, heart pounding, and immediately falls to his knees beside his bed, overcome by the sacredness of what he has seen. The words echo in his mind, their meaning beginning to take root in his soul. As the weight of the vision fades, a darker realization begins to settle in. The dreamer's sacred resolve turns to sorrow, a deep and painful awareness of how much he has changed, how his eyes have been opened to a reality that now feels so distant from his everyday life. The image of the radiant woman, her command to gather the children and teach them the way to salvation, cuts sharply through his heart, bringing to mind the faces of his own children. In his mind's eye, he sees them, plastered in front of television screens, their expressions vacant as they are absorbed by the glow of mindless entertainment. His teenage children, once filled with innocence, are now lost in the shallow vanity of their reflection, transfixed by mirrors or staring down at the screens of their phones, consuming a world that is not their own. They are prisoners of an invisible prison, bound by the world's allure, and the dreamer feels the crushing weight of his failure as a father. His wife, always so well-intentioned, tries to manage the household, but he knows their routine all too well. Together, they had spent most days of the week watching television, seeking comfort and distraction in the artificial worlds it offered, rather than cultivating a life rooted in the truth. The world has them, has had them for years, and he now sees, with agonizing clarity, the chains that bind them. The sorrow is overwhelming. He feels it consume him, the tears flowing profusely as the deep sadness for his failures as a father, a husband, and as a man of faith overwhelms him. He knows he should have done more, led them differently, and protected their souls from the very influences he had once indulged in. In his grief, he begins to resolve. No, he must change things. He knows now that he cannot return to the way things were. His heart aches for his children, for the purity they have lost, and for the wife he knows is struggling under the weight of their shared spiritual neglect. He resolves that he will take action to pull them from the grips of this world, to lead them to the path that the radiant woman had revealed to him in his dream. It is then, amidst his tears and sorrow, that something shifts within him. A strange awareness begins to dawn. The sacredness of the vision, the overwhelming sadness. It all feels so real, yet not real. He starts to realize, with a deepening sense of clarity, that this is not the waking world. He is dreaming. Chapter 20 Horror and Resolution The dreamer's heart races as this truth emerges. He is in another world a world that exists behind closed eyelids, but one that feels as if it holds more meaning than the physical world he wakes to each day. The sorrow, the vision, the message, all of it is tied to this dream realm, but its implications for his waking life are undeniable. Though he lies in a cot, in some distant corner of his mind, his soul is traversing a path of its own. He knows now what he must do, both in this dream and when he wakes. The tears stop, 
replaced by the burning resolve of a man who has seen what must be done. As the dreamer kneels, still in prayer, the world around him begins to dissolve once again, fading like a mist evaporating in the sunlight. The familiar sensation of being drawn into another vision takes hold, but this time, it's different. Emerging from the shadows, he sees her, the first woman, the one he had seen crying on the stone in an earlier vision. She is weeping, her face buried in her hands as before, her shoulders trembling with the weight of sorrow. He watches her, his heart breaking for her pain, but then something miraculous begins to unfold. Slowly, ever so gently, she pulls her right hand down from her tear-streaked face, revealing eyes full of wet agony. Her cheeks glisten with the remnants of her sorrow, but there's a shift. As if a bomb has been applied to her suffering, a transformation occurs. Like the subtle effect of a warm, calming intoxication, not in a negative sense but something good, something restorative, her expression changes. At first, it's almost imperceptible, but the dreamer sees it. Her lips begin to curve, her face softens, and before his eyes, she begins to smile, small, childlike, and filled with a depth of trust that overwhelms him. It's not a smile of ignorance, not one that denies her pain but one that grows out of a profound trust, a belief that everything will be okay. She trusts him. This realization hits him like a wave, knocking the breath from his chest. She trusts him. The warmth of this understanding fills him with a joy that defies description. It's like the weight of the world has been lifted from him, the sorrow of moments before fading away, replaced by this moment of shared trust and faith. The vision is almost too wonderful to bear, but it fades, as dreams often do, leaving behind only the warmth in his heart and a deep sense of gratitude. But before he can fully process what he's just seen, another face appears, one that catches him by surprise. It's the face of the man he had seen at the chapel, the man with the black-veiled wife, the one who had introduced him to the reverent mass. His features are unmistakable, olive-skinned, with a strong jawline and a kind, warm expression. Syrian? Yes, perhaps. The dreamer isn't sure, but there is no mistaking the connection. The man is now dressed in the white coat of a doctor, his expression filled with a kind of gentle reassurance that only a physician could have. Wait. The dreamer mutters, confusion setting in. Why is my right leg still broken? He looks down expecting to see himself whole after the catharsis of the visions, but the pain remains. His leg is still injured, unmoving. Panic surges, the warmth from before giving way to cold reality. The doctor places a hand on his shoulder, a gentle but firm gesture. You're not going to be able to use that leg without support, he says, his voice soft yet matter-of-fact. It's paralyzed. The damage from the injury, it didn't affect the vital parts of your brain, but your leg, it's a casualty. The words land heavily. The dreamer looks up at the doctor, his thoughts racing. Paralysis? He'd had no idea. But as the words settle in, the dreamer realizes that this is not a dream. The memory of the injury, of how he got here, begins to resurface like a dam breaking. It all comes flooding back in a sudden, violent torrent. He remembers the safe, the cold, metallic hum of its lock as his fingerprint scanned, the weight of the small black point .22 handgun he had bought for home defense. He hadn't thought much about it at the time. It had happened so fast. Barely a thought crossed his mind before he raised the gun to his temple and pulled the trigger. The sound had been loud but brief, the world fading into an immediate void. He hadn't remembered it in the dream before, but now the images flash in his mind with terrifying clarity. He had tried to take his own life. He had almost succeeded. The gravity of the realization pulls him into a pit of despair. Deep sorrow wells up from within, drowning him. He had done it. He had tried to end everything. And now, now he's left with this broken body, this leg that may never move again. But even worse, his thoughts shift to his wife and children. What would have happened to them? The guilt gnaws at him, sharp and unforgiving. His wife. How would she have lived with that? His children. How could he have abandoned them like that? His heart clenches in pain, not from the bullet wound, 
but from the wound he had almost inflicted on the people he loves most. Tears fill his eyes, and the strength of his body seems to drain. The doctor watches him with a patient, understanding gaze, not pressing, but simply standing beside him as the weight of it all crushes the dreamer's spirit. But somewhere in the back of his mind, beyond the pain, beyond the sorrow, he knows this isn't the end. He's been given another chance, a gift. Though the weight is heavy, he knows he must carry it, not for himself, but for them, for his wife, for his children. He may be broken, but he's alive. And as long as he has breath, there is hope. The hospital room was quiet, save for the rhythmic beeping of the heart monitor beside him. The dreamer lay in the sterile, white bed, staring up at the ceiling, his body aching from the wounds of his past decisions and the journey he'd taken, both in the waking world and in his dreams. The bed felt hard beneath him, but it was real, solid, a kind of painful comfort that reassured him he was alive. It had been days since the dream had shattered his illusions, since the flood of memories had returned, and since the terror of what could have been overwhelmed him. He had drifted in and out of consciousness, occasionally lucid, occasionally lost in fevered dreams of monsters, failures, and the lives he had almost destroyed. But now his mind was sharper, the fog lifting. He knew what he had to do. The door to his room creaked open. It was her, his wife. She stood there, fragile but strong, a mixture of fear and hope written across her face. She hadn't left his side since she had gotten the call, but this was the first time they were truly alone. The dreamer turned his head toward her, eyes brimming with an emotion he hadn't allowed himself to feel in a long time. Vulnerability. She walked slowly to his bedside, her steps tentative, as if unsure whether she would find the man she married lying there, or someone else. I, I'm sorry, he said, his voice cracked, barely a whisper. She shook her head, tears filling her eyes, but she didn't say a word. Instead, she reached out, took his hand in hers, and sat beside him, her presence warm and comforting. For a long time, they sat there in silence, both overwhelmed by the magnitude of what had happened. Words seemed too fragile to hold the weight of everything they felt. Finally, she spoke. I was afraid I had lost you. Her words broke something in him. The dam burst, and he began to sob, quietly at first, but soon uncontrollably. His body shook with the force of it, and she held him, her arms wrapping around him, her tears mingling with his. I was gone, he whispered through the sobs. I was gone, and I nearly left you all behind. I nearly left you, the kids. She shushed him, stroking his hair. But you didn't. You're here. You're alive. He pulled back slightly, looking into her eyes. I need to make it right. I need to change things. For you, for the kids, for me. His voice was steadier now, filled with resolve. And then, without thinking, he said it. I want to make a list. She looked at him, confused. A list? Yes. He swallowed hard, his mouth dry. A list of everything I need to do, everything we need to do, to live the life we should have been living all along. I can't go back and undo what's been done, but I can try to make it right going forward. We can. Will you help me? Her eyes softened, and she nodded. Of course I will. He reached for the small notebook that sat on the bedside table. His hand trembled slightly as he opened it and found a pen. He took a deep breath and began to write, the words flowing from his heart, not from his mind. He handed her the notebook, his hand shaking slightly. I'm going to need your help to make this happen, he said quietly. She took the notebook and looked down at the words, her own tears falling onto the page. She smiled, though it was bittersweet. We'll do it, she whispered. We'll do it together. And in that moment, the dreamer knew. He wasn't just making a list. He was making a promise, one that would change everything. The reunion wasn't filled with fireworks or grand gestures. It was quiet, simple, but profound. It was a moment of grace, a moment of conversion, and it was enough. He had been lost, but now he was found. And now there was work to do. The list would guide them, but the love they had rediscovered in their brokenness 
would be the strength that sustained them. For the first time in a long time, the dreamer felt the warmth of hope. The list. 1. No more television. We've spent too many hours numbing ourselves with mindless entertainment while our children drift further from us. The screens have stolen enough of our time. No more distractions from each other, from God. We will spend our time together, talking, praying, laughing. 2. Pray the rosary together every night. We will bring the Blessed Mother into our home, into our hearts. Every evening, as a family, we will kneel together and pray. We will ask for guidance, for protection, and for strength. We need her to be the center of our home. Her intercession our daily bread. 3. Daily Mass, whenever possible. No more skipping Mass for convenience or comfort. I will lead us in this. We will be present before the altar, where Christ offers himself for us every day. I will teach the kids the beauty of the Latin Mass, the reverence, the seriousness. We will show them that our faith is not a part of our lives, it is our life. 4. Teach the children the Catechism. No more excuses about how busy we are. Our children need to know their faith, deeply, intimately. I will teach them. We will sit down together, go through the catechism, question by question. They will know why we believe what we believe, and they will be prepared for the world's lies. 5. No more cell phones for the kids. They have become slaves to the screen. I've let happen. No more. We will take them back, help them rediscover the joy of living without constant connection to the digital world. Their eyes will see God's creation, not a virtual one. 6. Confession every week. We will keep ourselves clean before God. We will make the sacrament of confession a regular part of our lives. I will be the first to confess, to show them the way. We will not live in sin, hidden or ignored. We will live in grace. 7. Make our home a tabernacle. The world is full of chaos, noise, and temptation. Our home will be different. It will be a place of peace, of prayer, of love. It will be a sanctuary, a refuge from the storm outside. The Holy Spirit will dwell here. This is what I will build for you, for our children. Chapter 21 The sun is in the east even though the day is done. The night after their reunion was quiet, almost surreal in its simplicity. The house was warm, filled with the sounds of laughter that had been absent for so long. His wife had set a place for him at the table, and the children rushed to sit close, their faces beaming with an innocence that softened the edges of the world. They spoke of small things, mundane things, the kind of talk that weaves itself through the fabric of everyday life, and yet it felt like a gift to hear it again. Later, when the house grew still and the lights dimmed, they lay beside one another, his wife resting her head on his shoulder as if no time had passed at all. He closed his eyes, breathing in the peace that had once seemed so distant. For the first time in what felt like years, he fell into a sleep without dreams of worry or struggle. But then, in the quiet of the night, a new dream came. He found himself sitting in the front seat of a large, weathered van parked in the middle of a vast, empty parking lot. Around him, a few other vans were scattered across the lot, but the space felt hollow, abandoned, as if the world had shifted in a way that left only remnants behind. It was an ordinary place he knew that much like the kind of parking lot outside a department store where families might shop on a Sunday afternoon. But now, there was no one, only silence. Then, the low crackle of an emergency broadcast came over the van's radio. The voice was calm, too calm, announcing that a massive storm was approaching. He glanced at the darkening sky through the windshield. Heavy clouds were rolling in, the kind that carried something far more dangerous than just rain. And yet he realized there was something oddly perfect about where he was. Here, in the middle of the lot, far from the buildings and towering structures that might fall, he and his family were safe. It was as if the storm was inevitable, but they had found shelter without even trying, as if some unseen hand had guided them there. As the radio continued, he felt a strange sense of clarity. This storm, whatever it was, was only the beginning. There was more to come, more to be faced, both for him and for the world outside this parking lot. 
the world had changed, was changing still. The van was safe for now, but how long could they stay in this quiet before the winds picked up? He woke just before dawn, the dream fading but the weight of its meaning lingering. For a moment, he stayed still, listening to the soft breathing of his wife beside him. Outside, the wind rustled gently, and the house was calm. But somewhere beyond this peaceful morning, he knew the storm was coming.